One special thank you we'd like to give is to Pay Safecard. Not only did they get involved in MEO national events in Austria, Italy, Greece, Germany, and Spain, but they are giving 1,000 euros prize money to each of our three winners across all three titles. I'm Frankie Ward, I'm presiding over the casting desk, and given that I am a Baby Dragon fanatic, I'm very, very delighted to tell you that this episode is all about Clash Royale, and I've got three musketeers on the casting desk to join me and chat about the matches we're about to see, and they are Ark, Trid, and Excoundrel. Hello, gentlemen, how are you doing, Trid? Uh, doing well, Frankie. It's uh, great to be back doing some Clash Royale. It's a game that's uh, close to my heart, so it's nice to dabble every now and then in the eSport. And, and Ark, I thought you were Brawl Stars, but you're actually clashing too. Oh yeah, I played all the Super Star titles actually, and I uh, played Clash Royale for many years. And I've, got a, I've got a pretty good profile, I'm not gonna lie, but uh, yeah, it's good to come back to my roots every now and again, and uh, it's always exciting to watch games go down. And Alexandra, you're a really, really busy man. Like, when are you able to play Clash? Is it a toilet situation? Are you just... Nah, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head there. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't get too much time to dabble in Clash uh, as much as I used to, but uh, if you know me, I'm a mobile gaming fanatic. I've been around many, many mobile esports in my uh, career, and Clash is just one of them that I uh, have brushed with over the years, and I'm very, very excited to dive into some of the best Clash uh, tournament in Europe. Trid, last time I covered Clash Royale was with you at Red Bull MEO Season 1 and it was really, really exciting to sort of dive into the game, watch the pros do it because I was no good at playing it myself, to be perfectly honest with you. How exciting is the scene right now? Um, well, like when it comes around to the MEO, it's going to be fantastic because obviously we've got this global competition. So whenever this comes around on a, what I hope is continues to be a near annual basis, it's always a bit of a celebration to get to see all these players come together and you get out. So it's very exciting times in the scene. Well, let's take a look at the exciting schedule for today. We are going to be talking through the top 32 and the top 16 before we bring you all of the matches from the top eight. And we're going to be having analysis from the man himself. It wouldn't really be a Clash tournament without him, would he? Unfortunately, he can't be with me in my place in London. I, I really wish he was. He's, he's great at energising, to be perfectly honest. I, Woody, if you're watching this, you're, you're welcome around mine anytime once this is all over. So we're going to have analysis from him and we're going to have interviews from our fantastic reporter Freya too. And let's talk through the format as well. So as I mentioned before, there's a top 32 because 32 players from around the world won their respective heats and they were all due to come to, uh, to Madrid and hang out with us in Spain and compete. But unfortunately, circumstances meant they had to play from home. They are playing in a single elimination uh, format with each match being a best of five. And so we'll be finding out later on who reached the playoffs from that top 32. And they're playing for a prize pool of 40,000 euros for first place, picking up a whopping 25,000. And if you've never watched Clash Royale before, if you've never played it, well, first of all, download it on your phone right away. What are you doing? And second of all, Freya is here to explain to you how it all works. Clash Royale is a Tower Rush esports title, most commonly played competitively 1v1. The objective of the game is to destroy more towers than your opponents. Each player has three towers, two crown towers on each lane and a king behind them. However, players can instantly win a game by destroying their opponent's king tower. Players destroy towers by using their cards, each costing a certain amount of elixir, which regenerates in your elixir bar throughout the game. A player's deck is created before entering the game and consists of eight different cards, which cycle through during each game. These cards vary in their rarity, split into four categories, common, rare, epic, and legendary. Cards can vary widely in terms of their abilities. Some are ground troops, others are rare, and you can also place buildings in the areas of the map you control. These units are then placed into the arena, which deal damage to other enemy troops alongside the opponent's towers. There are many different types of decks and playstyles in Clash Royale. Some may be more aggressive, others more defensive. 
but all players share the same objective of claiming the most towers to win. Thank you so much Freya and hopefully those of you who haven't picked up the game yet will consider giving it a go after that explainer. It's a lot of fun and you're going to see experts playing it today. And let's talk about those experts gentlemen because we've got the top 32 players. Some of them are returning from the previous uh, Red Bull MEO season one and some of them, in fact most of them, are brand new faces. So first of all Trid, Thunderstruck, the champion from season one has returned. Absolutely, and really excited about that one. He had a fantastic performance over in Dortmund, surprising a lot of people as well. He was definitely not the favorite to win out our last world championship, but he was able to do so in style, and the person he was able to defeat in the finals is also here, Frankie. Why, 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 why? Although he's competing under a different name. And actually, one of the guys that I recognise is Milano from Belgium. He competed last year and Freya caught up with him to find out how he's feeling about Season 2 and his return. Milan from Belgium is joining me here today. Thank you so much for taking the time out to speak to me. Um, firstly, I kind of wanted to ask about your match against Zolag. Obviously, we unfortunately saw you lose out 0-3. What kind of issues were you facing in that game? Uh, so basically, uh, the first game was uh, kind of counter because I, I didn't really have anything to uh, defend the flying machine with. I was playing Splash Art and he was playing uh, a Lava deck, which is uh, really strong against uh, Splash Art usually. Then the second game was uh, pretty close, also a pretty even matchup, but he did a, did a good job, good job uh, protecting his uh, rascals, the rascal girls. Uh, and he kept my baby dragon uh, distracted, so I wasn't really able to do any damage. Then uh, the third game, uh, I didn't really have any big spell for his princess or dark goblin, and I had to keep the arrows for uh, his goblin barrel. Uh, also, I was uh, playing uh, the Jason deck it's because it's named it's named like that because. Um, the very first Clash Royale tournament ever uh, in Helsinki was won by Jason, and uh, he played that deck. Oh, interesting! But yeah, in the in the recent in the four like yeah in the last four years, um, he the game has developed. So the deck is not really viable anymore. It's not really strong, a like, very strong option anymore. It's not really used. But uh, I figured I would just use it and see what happened. And yeah, okay, I did. I lo I lost, but yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, are there any players that you particularly would like to see go on and win the trophy at this year's Red Bull MEO World Finals? So basically, the people that I um, know the best within the community that all that are that were qualified for this tournament were Shikui and uh, Rengod, but the, both of them are also eliminated. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see now uh, maybe an underdog win like Neki Lik, who I've mentioned before, or Fuko, because yeah, I didn't really expect them to get this far, and now I hope that they win. Yeah, 100%. Everybody loves an underdog story. I'm definitely with you on yeah, that yeah. one. Thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to join me today. No problem. Thank you so much, Ray. And Milano Oil will be hoping he makes it further than the group stages, which is where he reached in season one of Red Bull MEO. But right now, I need to know, are there any other players we're expecting big things from or we've seen playing before? Anyone that's jumping out for you, Excoundrel? Yeah, I actually recognize uh, the juicy one, the um, US representative. I think I've seen him in a couple of tournaments that took place uh, as far back as 2018. So uh, I'm expecting, you know, especially US being such a fierce competition for Clash Royale, um, I'm expecting some kind, of, uh, some kind of performance from him. And Ark, any names that would make you tremble with fear if they popped up when you were solo queuing? I mean, as a Brit, I mean, I've definitely got to you know, stay true to my roots and I'm, I'm rooting for uh, Thunderstruck today. I mean, you know, I was in Dortmund last year and watching at the very front of the stage, so I'm expecting big things from him. Well, let's take a look at the bracket and find out how exactly our clashes will be trying to reach the grand final today. And first of all, we have our round of 32 players. It is single elimination. So after that round, we go to the 16 and then we finally go to the top eight, which is more like our traditional playoffs, our quarters, semis, uh, and then our final, of course. And we will be having a third place match because the prize will actually only rewards the top 
three players. So really, everyone is trying to reach the top four. And when they get to the top four, they don't just stop there. They're still trying to compete because there's a 5,000 euro prize that goes to the third place today. So without further ado, let's talk about the highlights. Let's talk about what happened in the round 32 and 16 as well. Let's take a look at the results, gentlemen. I mean, for a start, the most surprising one for me is, is Thunderstruck. Actually, we lost him in, in the first 32 against Araju 11, and he only managed to pick up one, one game, Tread. Yeah, that's a disappointing first round for Thunderstruck. I think he's going to be kicking himself off that one. Uh, not able to progress anywhere near to successfully defending his championship but now it's all up for grabs that's probably the most exciting part about it uh in that first round is just seeing thunderstruck the defending champion getting knocked out from the off and the juicy one there that was mentioned by you scoundrel he was a player you wanted to highlight he seemed to sail through his first round 3-0 yeah 3-0 the juicy one uh again from what i know of this guy i don't expect anything less uh, again, I'm just as surprised about Trid as Thunderstruck. That's a, a pretty big loss given he was our previous champion. Round of 32 is still good, but you don't get any money. So uh, he'll be walking home unhappy. But yeah, good to see the juicy one, 3-0. Uh, and uh, hopefully he'll continue to perform throughout the tournament. Now, we are through to our playoffs now. We've had our top 32, our top 16, and now we're in our top eight. So we're going to kick off with our first quarterfinal. And it is Russia versus Bulgaria, aka Paradox 955 versus Ivan CR. And Ivan, gentlemen, seems to be a player with a bit of pedigree. He placed top eight at the World Cyber Games in 2019. So I have a feeling, Ark, he might be quite confident about his chances. Yeah, I mean, absolutely so. And he did so well in the previous rounds. You know, it was a bit of a, bit of a close one, three, two prior to this. But um, I kind of feel like, you know, the luck could be in his court today. And um, yeah, keen to see what kind of uh, cars he brings to his deck. And Trid, he says that one of his best ladder finishes is 19th. Now, I don't know if that's regional or worldwide, but that seems to be quite impressive to me for someone who's probably said me pro, Trid. Yeah, you'll see a lot of pros who will hit the ladder hard and get those high rankings, but a lot of the time, some of them actually step back from it and are not too focused on ladder and like to play in these smaller tournaments or go through grand challenges and whatnot. So his placement is high, is impressive, but it is not the make or break in his professional career. Excalibur, do you think it's quite good to be more of an unknown like Paradox 955 in a competition like this? It can sometimes help. Um, obviously, scouting is really important. Understanding which decks that your opponent might favor is also incredibly important. And sometimes when they play in large scale stream tournaments, you'll get an idea about what that kind of play or what play style that player kind of tends to gravitate towards. So sometimes when you're coming as an, in and as an unknown, you can bring something completely out of the blue or just run styles that your opponent isn't comfortable with and it may give you an edge. So this could be good for Paradox. Well, we don't really know what decks these boys are bringing, so I think we should get into our first quarterfinals and find out. All right, so it looks like myself and Ark will be running through the first game with you today. Like we already said, we got Paradox 955 going up against Ivan, and they're both burning a lot of elixir right now, Ark. No one willing to make that first move. Usually, that's indicative of someone playing around a slightly heavier deck and going for a bit of a beatdown. Yeah, it's always the, the interesting stage, isn't it? Who is going to play their cards or show their cards first? And uh, no fireballs, no snowballs, nothing going down, just a stalemate. No one wants mm -hmm. to give away any secrets as, at this stage. Okay, so if they're going to burn down the clock, it means if you're new to Clash Royale, at one minute we enter double elixir time. So the rate of generation is so much higher that it's worthwhile holding onto your cards until then so you can get all your units out and hit them hard on the first attempt with no counter. The fact that both players are doing this show, telling us that they're both running beatdowns. Now in terms of cards to look out for with a beatdown deck in the current meta, we're going to see potentially a lot of Golem, a lot of Mega Knight, things like this. They could potentially be going a little bit more aerial with the Lava Loon as well. So there's lots of options and lots of ways this can manifest. Yeah, absolutely. And the Battle Healer as well being so prominent right now in beatdown decks, I expect to kind of see that coming through maybe uh the hill spirit as well as the, that is a very strong card in the current meta and um you know with without much time spent it can really overwhelm you and take that tower down quickly 
All right, so we've got 30 seconds left on the clock. So we're looking for these large units to come out first, be reinforced by others. And also there's an issue of which lanes you go down. Do you try and trade, outpace your opponent? Do you try and match them? We're going to see how they fall down. And they may not be as coordinated because most of them might want to hit the mark at one minute exactly. But they are going to make their moons any second now with 10 seconds left on the clock. Yeah, Paradox is putting a little emote down. And we are going to see the first card there, the Knights going down, going towards that right-hand side, like the Mega Minion in response to that and now we are going to see double elixir time things are going to start picking up pretty quickly good yeah mega minion and the knights going down as well everything stacking up on this right hand lane for now valkyrie going up against the knight fireball's going to hit multiple targets so that's great value for ivan in this engagement but of course he's fighting against the barb hut and the rest of the towers Graveyard, no, sorry, not Graveyard, Tombstone being spawned out as well, should the track to some of the aggro. But there's that beefy unit being played, Lava Loon coming down on the right-hand side, and the Graveyard on the left to try and trade out. Yeah, great amount of damage from that Graveyard on that left-hand side lane, Lava um, coming on the right-hand side, that Lava Hound, and the Bloom behind it as well. If there's a Freeze potentially in this deck as well, this could be devastating on this right-hand side lane. It might be his final card arc, but there's a lot of buildings to distract the balloon, so I wouldn't worry too much. Gonna go ahead and commit the fireball to get rid of the Mega Minion. The balloon's gonna connect with the right hand tower as well. That's one bomb being dropped down. Looking for the second. Even if he gets dropped in Martyrdom, he will still walk away with the victory. And the first round going the way of Ivan. Wow, fantastic play at the end there. I did wonder whether those Barbarian Huts were going to be enough to distract the balloon, but it wasn't enough. The balloon connected, and that is the end of that first game. So great performance. We both know they're going with beat down decks, but one of the best things about mobile esports and how fast and short these rounds are is that we allow for lots of iteration arc. We can have changes in complete decks and play styles if it's not to their suiting. So we're going to jump into the second game just as fast as we jumped into the first. Now I wonder whether we will see the same strategy at the beginning of this round. Both teams obviously want to get into double elixir. It's only going to help their position to be in that position. Actually saying that, Paradox is throwing straight away out with a, uh, a bar barrel. Taken down quickly by the Musketeer return. I think it's just a cycle out to get an ideal hand. He's going to commit even more with the Barbarian Hut now just to keep the pressure on the right hand side. Earthquake being committed to destroy the structures. So that's going to hit both Barb Hut and the turret dealing some damage as the musketeer comes marching by should be traded out but we'll make sure that barb hut gets destroyed dark prince on the right hand side that's going to require a response from paradox to match him yep getting some good value here from this dark prince taking down these barbarians very easily done um the sparky in the back as well uh definitely going to be giving something for paradox to think about placing down the baby dragon as well um sparky i find can be quite difficult to deal with and be interesting to see how paradox responds to this well, he's going to have the Baby Dragon deal an aggro. Great drop there by the Goblin Giant. He's going to draw the aggro of that Baby Dragon and support the Sparky for coming in. Graveyard could be the perfect response here. A lot of skeletons spawning around the Sparky will split his focus. The Goblin Giant has connected, but the Sparky will not find the right mark when he's having to deal with all these skellies. But the Pekka playing clearance has now cleared a path for the Sparky to connect. If he can just get rid of the Knight, Ewiz, just in time to keep this perpetual reset. But that will not last for long, Ark. Yeah, it was a great reset. Uh, but definitely I would say that Paradox has shown some cards that he would have perhaps preferred to have kept under his belt there. The grave, uh, Graveyard especially uh, can be such a prominent card on offense and now having to use that on defense is going to give uh, Ivan a bit of a heads up now as to what uh, Paradox's plan might have been uh, coming up to double Elixir. Well, two seconds remaining on that one. So Barb Hart going to be committed. Spawn it. Parky, Sparky coming out of this one again. Barbs are going to be an easy target for that one. No one's going to be living through that blast from the Sparky on the right-hand side. Yep, and again, uh, that Earthquake spell going down as well, getting some great value, just trying to get those Barbarians to stop spawning for the time of, the, of which the Sparky to come. Uh, poison going down as well. Good timing on that. She gets some good value. Um, but this is looking like a pretty good push here coming in, and Paradox is going to have to respond now. Uh, he was going down as well. Um, that's actually not a bad defense. No, and he's got a great opportunity for counter-attack here, even committing the graveyard as well. So that Dark Prince might get overwhelmed and not be able to draw all the aggro. He's got to bear in mind, there's stuff coming down on the right-hand lane now, committing the bar barrel as well. This is a beefy push onto the right-hand side, and there's no answer. The good game comes out, and Paradox claps back. A great return then. Wow, this is a, a really, really great response. I think it's going to tie things up here. Only three seconds left. Ivan's already saying good game. This one is over. 
Uh, the game was already over once the first tower went down with that one arc. There was no chance he was going to get the connection onto the right-hand side and level it out. So it does mean we are tied in the series so far as we're getting ready to jump into game number three. Both teams running similar composition still. Nothing to out there yet no real big variation just moving on to the uh, graveyard control and then also still having um still having elements of the beat down in effect from both cut decks yeah it would be uh, just to see when we're going to see some uh, some additional healing at the moment because it would be mm -hmm. ideal to kind of have in amongst these decks to be honest and um it's definitely you know not holding these uh, these two players back but um you know they are just very good cards at the moment i'm just kind of surprised i've not seen them yet so far well, looks like we're going to have another beatdown scenario here. No one cycling any of their cards early. Going to get quite beefy again. So, we've not seen the Mega Knight variation come down. Both teams actually... Um, both teams actually re not relying on that card in particular with their beatdown. They were trying to just overwhelm the units altogether. And I think that potentially uh, we might see something a little bit stronger coming out in this next round. Yeah, it would be a good time to do so and just to kind of pace uh, themselves in and not show everything all at once. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that, that a Golem deck could be quite a good one to bring in at this point mm -hmm. in time or, or something along those lines really to kind of like just have a bit of a shock value, I think, really. I expect Ivan's actually going to end up running the Lava Loon again. He found success with that in game number one, so to bring it back out again mm. wouldn't be too far out of the ordinary. It's sort of Paradox has also reverted to his game one strat, or maybe he's preparing for an Aerial Assault to come in, something that will shut that down, something with structures to draw the aggro from the balloon over. We'll have to wait and find out. We've got 25 seconds before double licks of time, and that's when things are going to start exploding. Yeah, we haven't seen any Bomb Tower yet as well. Bomb Tower's a really, really good card right now in the current meta, and... Um... Um, yeah, definitely you can see uh, an Earthquake spell or two here in response to those kinds of things. And uh, But uh, at the moment, no cards still shown with getting close to uh, Double Elixir, and that's when things are going to mm -hmm. spice up. Yeah, five seconds remaining before the first card should be getting played. A lot of spilled Elixir. They don't want to be burning through any more efficiently. Waiting for the first person to draw their hand. So there's the Lava Hound on the left-hand side for Under Ivan. Being reacted by Paradox, they could be running identical comps here. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that they both played the same card at the same time, minion inbound. There we are going to see the bomb tower as well. That will provide a, uh, a pretty decent distraction. The baby dragon in the back as well. And I wonder whether Ivan has got a free to the sleep. Oh, the inferno dragon's actually locked onto the balloon. That's huge to shut this down. Going to sacrifice the bomb tower and then potentially move on to the lava loot. Great response there with the minions to make sure that beefier unit's not going to get burned down. The paradox's, I, uh, paradox's lava hound has made that first connection onto the left hand and side they did get caught up by the arrows to immediately remove them can't do that for the second lava hound they're still trucking a lot yeah paradox placed down a second uh, lava hound didn't really uh serve to much avail and now in the response ivan coming down with one minion in the back as well getting some hits surely on this uh, inferno dragon and um uh, yeah it seems like uh, paradox will uh, came out uh worse on on that trade-off there the mine is in the pocket of Paradox, so we need to keep an eye on that one. It's going to be able to chip away. Even though we've got two minutes left, it could make the difference, especially with the poison as well. So that's going to round up the deck for Paradox, and he has these options to chip away should he find a, an advantage or a window of opportunity to strike when this heavier deck from uh, Ivan comes knocking on his door. Yeah, Paradox bringing the uh, the poison spell there is going to allow him to do just that, chipping away along with the miner as well, getting some really nice damage there as well. And now this could be a, a pretty decent push if Ivan can get something to support this uh, this Lava Hound coming in here. Um, but at the moment, uh, I'm really liking the fact that uh, Paradox has got that poison to hand. Okay, so that fiber is actually huge right now. The connection is still going to come in for the Inferno Dragon to shut down the balloon. He might be able to get one in connection. No, it's just going to drop his dying bomb on the site. Snowball being committed there just to get rid of the rest of the lava pups as they move onto the tombstone in the center of the map. Cannot find a connection with Ivan's tower. 60 seconds remaining and another lava hound being placed for Paradox on the left hand side. Yeah, only one minute left now. Things are really starting to speed up here as there's another Inferno Dragon going down there in response to uh, Ivan's Lava Hound Fireball going down as well, taking the towers at 700. The blue is coming in, but shut down by the poison at the last moment. And now Paradox able to go on the retreat here, on the push going in on that tower. Poison going down as well. It could be over here now, Trent. 
Gonna go for the push, but there's a lot of counter attack coming into this one. If that Inferno Dragon connects, it could be all over. Luckily, the Mega Minion is gonna go ahead and catch the aggro for that one. They're still chipping away at the tower. The balloon should now draw the aggro, but I don't see how Ivan comes back into this one with 15 seconds remaining. Miner gone to the left hand side. The poison's there as well to chip through. The Inferno Dragon gonna connect on this one, and that's Paradox walking away with the third game. <laughs> My goodness me, it was pretty close at the end, not gonna lie, 98 HP left on the Paradox's tower there, but uh, a great result there, and uh, that's gonna put him into the lead now. Yeah, so we potentially got match point for, uh, for Paradox, he just needs to win one more game, and he will advance through to the semi-finals and get one step closer to being crowned our MEO champion. Game number four, jumping on your screens right now. And there's a minor being played early by Paradox as well as the Wall Breakers. Wow, really, really uh, different pacing that we're seeing already in this game. Paradox uh, not wasting any time there and throwing those wall breakers down early on. Uh, good to see the Mega Knight making an appearance as well. And um, I do like that card myself. I think it's a, a great addition to a, to a strong deck. And um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what else is in wait as it's uh, definitely Paradox showing more uh, in, in his deck than uh, Ivan at this stage. Yeah, Mega Knight's like, what if we made Pekka do AoE and jump? Is essentially <laughs> what we ended up with with that card. So it's an interesting prospect. Inferno Dragon, gonna be distracted by those goblins coming in. The Ice Wizard still doing work. But that's an offensive minor being used from Paradox. It might be the solution to catch the bandit and getting that burst damage from the dash into play. But the Ram Rider's gonna run on through, drawn into the center by the bomb tower. So that's gonna stop all the damage going through to his Princess Towers. Yeah, defensive minor, not something that you see every day, but it does seem to work out there. Um, and uh, the moments, yeah, it's interesting to see such different cards this time round. Uh, both these players are trying their best to uh, keep their opposition guessing in that respect. And um, yeah, very, very different comp uh, in regards to their decks this time around. And this, uh, this Mega Knight deck needs to start getting some connections onto Paradox, otherwise he will just win out by being able to chip through. It doesn't look like it, but when you start to allow the Miner to get through, it's going to be causing some difficulties. He's able to control this deck coming out from Ivan quite comfortably. So Paradox needs to find a way to start connecting onto these turrets and start chipping them away. Meanwhile, Ivan needs to start getting these larger units connected and dealing the damage. Yeah, great play there with the uh, bar, uh, Barbar on the left-hand side, just taking his wall breakers down nicely. The Electro Wiz on the right-hand side, just nicely supported of the, the Mega Knight, but I think the Mega Knight will go down uh, there with that Destructive Miner, and a uh, good opportunity now just to kind of reset and gain some Elixir here. Right, Tornado's gonna pull the Inferno Dragon away, but the Bandit still catches the Miner, dashes onto the Breakers, and then gets the reset onto the Ice Wizard, gonna dash into the middle of the Goblins. Won't find the burst damage, and will get shut down eventually. But the Mega Knight being played further back here for Ivan on the left-hand side. It gives him time to build something up with this push and try and brute force his way onto one of the Princess Towers. I think about the value that Paradox is getting from that Miner there on that right-hand side, so much damage, um, and it was completely uncontested, and now the, uh, the Bomb Tower going to gain some good value as well. The Ram Rider going in to take that down, however. Um, that was, uh, I, I think for me, Paradox got a, a great trade-off there with that right-hand side tower on Ivan. Well, Ivan, he's going to have the rocket sent towards his tower. He's going to drop down the Mega Knight on the right-hand side. But it doesn't matter about being slowed. He's still going to be able to leap at your wizard and shut him down. But the splash damage is good enough to start chipping away at that turret. Bomb Tower should throw the aggro, and Miner gonna catch the Mega Knight before he can leap off and get that AoE damage. Putting them all to the center, this could be big for the AoE damage if they don't separate away from the bomb after being tornadoed into the center of the map. Yeah, Paradox is using uh, the Bomb Tower to such great effect, and it's definitely causing Ivan some issues. But now the left-hand side, a rocket in response to that Inferno Dragon that did lock onto the tower there. Could have uh, got a lot more damage had that not been uh, shut down there quickly with that rocket uh, by Paradox. But it's a significant Elixir advantage now for Ivor, and he has a Mega Knight on the board. He's still surpassing the Elixir, or basically in play for Paradox. So if he cannot get countered here and force his units through, he's found a path to victory by forcing out that rocket against the Infernal Dragon. Ram Raider connects on the right-hand side, and this Infernal Dragon is still chipping away. It's going to find a connection on the left until it's pulled in by the Tornado, and it will be drawn to aggro the Ice Wizard. 
45 seconds remaining and Ivan still in control of the economy of this game. Yeah, great to see Ivan starting to get his uh, his flow here, he's getting the swing of things, uh, getting even more additional damage on that right hand side now, but this uh, Mega Knight on the left hand side here is going to get distracted then by the bomb tower, and it does look like Ivan's finally found his rhythm in getting those bomb towers down quickly to get these pushes. But the poison, the poison arc has already eroded everything, and the Mega Knight's got that connection on the right hand side, dragged across by the tornado of Paradox, and reinforcements are coming in, another Mega Knight, and the Infernal Dragon pushing hard on the right hand side as we enter with eight seconds remaining the poison deployed chipping away constantly the rocket trying to equalize the damage and tie this one out but the tiebreaker comes in the hp is lower for paradox and ivan will walk away with our fourth game wow we are now all tied up then it's going to come down to this next game both players are not taking this lying down Absolutely not, Ark, and we're going to the distance in the first series we are going to cover as well. So there's just one game that separates their opponents from going through to our semi-final. We want to jump into that action as fast as we can. Game number five coming on your screens right now. Going in then again, a slow start, some emotes flying. Could have some heavy decks. Uh, oh, maybe not. We're going to get going then with a quick bar barrel uh, and some arrows, a tombstone. Nothing too much at the moment. Just kind of cycling through uh, to get to the tasty cards, I think, Trip. <laughs> Yeah, just draw some, uh, draw the cards, cycle through them, get yourself to your adequate hand. There's the Mega Minion and the Knight on the right hand side. The Skeletons are not going to do much by themselves being produced by the Tombstone. The value of that draws them over, but there's the Lava Hound on the right hand side to start forcing the cards out from both of our players. The Balloons back it up as well, so the Lava Loon coming in from Ivan is tried and trusted deck from game one. As the Poison's doing its best to erode, but the connection's still going to happen. That Balloon is going to touch the tower on the right hand side and that's a crushing blow to kick things off yeah fantastic start by ivan there and uh getting some really devastating damage early on i uh, you know we still got one minute before we've been close to double elixir time now so uh mm -hmm. definitely that's going to shake things up and paradox uh, a bit on the back foot now Gonna have to be reeling from that one. We know what happens if it goes down to the three minute overtime. It's whoever's HP has been damaged the most and we're gonna be relying on these barbs to try and cut away at the tombstone. The minions have got a line of sight on the barb hut. Gonna be pulled away, thankfully, but it's gonna be chipping away at the time. That you wanna look at health pools in this game arc as time when it comes to structures. And is it worth the elixir trade-off to reduce their spawn rate on the map? It's a conscious decision these guys need to be making. But the lava hound's gonna come in on the right hound side again. That means the balloon is sure to follow once the skies have cleared up a bit. Yeah, this barb hut is gonna be going down pretty quick, and I expect you're right for that to see a balloon coming in, or is the lava hound too low now? I think so to really make it worth the while and that is going to have to be held back upon um, uh, Fireball going down for some value there, but um, yeah, not really the push that uh, Ivan would have uh, hoped for in that instance. Well, it was good that he didn't overcommit with the balloon in that time, so he wasn't going for the push. Still got a significant HP lead against Paradox for the time being, so he is holding all the cards in that regard. But here's that beefy push being built up on the right-hand side. This is the one. We know Ivan has that balloon in his hand by this point, so he's going to commit to this one and try to brute force his way to victory. The poison's good to try and deter them, but there's nothing drawing the aggro. As soon as that balloon drops the balloon bomb on that hut, he's going to get away with it. The Mega Minion is lost interest in can't catch up. They're trying to stun it, but the Blom still comes through. And the Monodom will seal the deal. 13 seconds remaining. Ivan hasn't got a hope in hell of losing this one. Paradox, unfortunately, we will have to see you next year because Ivan's going through to the semi-finals. I can't believe that balloon connected. It really didn't look like it was going to, but congratulations to Ivan who will be going through. Yeah, congratulations. That one couldn't have been closer, could it, gentlemen? I'm just wondering about the, the trend of both of them or the coincidence of them both kicking off with a beatdown deck. And then I guess there must have been a case of second guessing each other when it came to picking their deck for the next round arc. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a bit of mind games going on there. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite common to see players uh, kind of keeping those cards back and just kind of waiting to see um, what the other player's going to do first. But um, yeah, some very exciting games, though. Why do you think Ivan edged it, Trid? Was it a case of better elixir management? 
I think when it came down to some of the games here, uh, it's not necessarily elixir management. There were some instances of card management. He left Paradox without an adequate response to what he was dealing with. The Infernal Dragon forcing out the rocket. That's a huge elixir commitment. And that gave Ivan the edge in game number four, which significantly increased his chances of coming back. So I don't know necessarily if it's elixir management. I think it's just um, the way the cycle was. It was unfortunate for Paradox and Ivan was just able to capitalize on it perfectly. Well, gentlemen, it's Spain versus Portugal. We've got ourselves an Iberian quarterfinals and I could not be happier about it. So let's get into the second quarterfinal. Okay, thank you very much, Frankie. We're going to jump into our second quarterfinals. Lucas going up against Bale. And already we're hoping to jump into the action as fast as we can. Yeah, we are going to be jumping into this game. And uh, actually, Spain and Portugal tend to produce really good. Oh, we're already in, actually. I was about to give you a little bit of a spiel there. But you can already see Goblin Hut coming down. Princess Archer just be able to trade back against that quite nicely. This looks like we're already off. No beat down. No waiting for double elixir. We are just throwing things onto the field right now. And uh, yeah, I think this is going to be a very quick one if you can see how much elixir is being spent already. Yeah, the skeleton's on the right-hand side. Great pull for the rascals. But there's that Megamite on the left. Going to shut down the bandit as well without that connection. Getting ready for that large drop, but there's nothing coming in here apart from the Dark Prince to be brought out. So now the Mega Knight has to commit with that on the left-hand side, but the Goblin Barrel needs a response as well. Yeah, Goblin Barrel always uh, needs a response. You can respond very easily with things like Snowball or, or Arrows or, uh, you know, plenty of other spells can do the, the, do the trick. And it looks like it didn't get much work done there either. Uh, the princess is going to be hard to deal. Well, it's going to easily shut down the spear goblins. Need to get further up and draw the aggro before it gets that chip damage in. Still going to commit the log to chip away at the HP. Being very mindful not to tag the king tower and activate that one. Musketeer on the left-hand side will probably draw the ire of this bandit if they're not too careful. But the connection is going to come in, but now be overwhelmed by these goblins. Yeah, it feels like uh, Bale is running a, a kind of a form of log bait here with the with the barrels and and, and the uh, the log as well. Just trying to use the prince to clean up and, and respond to anything thrown on, on either side. And then whenever he gets a chance, he's going to throw that uh, that barrel out to chip away at the either princess towers. You can see the rascals now just trying to uh, bounce off the mega knight, prevent them. From from getting too much damage onto the turret, but uh, they've got a good response here. Yeah, it's an easy pickup for the baby dragon just to shut this all down, but there's the graveyard being played onto the left-hand side. Dark Prince doing a good job so far, but he's not going to be able to handle that for long because he can only cover so much territory. Thankfully, the princess is there to pick up the slack, as always, and as it should be in fiction a little bit more, Kin. Yeah, I really like what Bale's doing. He's waiting for a certain amount of elixir to be committed before he's just throwing down that uh, that goblin barrel again, just looking for that chip damage. And every little bit of uh, chip damage he gets down is going to allow him to try and work with that single tower elimination when we get towards uh, the, the sudden death here. So I, I think Bale playing this really nicely so far. He's now committing to the right-hand side with that Dark Prince. The uh, barrel comes out once more. He's seen a lot of elixir committed with that Mega Knight. This is good damage going out to the right-hand side Princess Tower of Lucas. Yeah, it has to be the uh, tower you're hitting now of your bail. You've got control at the moment. The Mega Knight can be dealt with quite easily here with the Rascals. The time's going down into overtime, so that's a given. And then we're looking at one tower. That's all it's going to take. Nice rocket being committed there, so we know that's in his hand. He can cycle through to that for the victory, or he can just do it himself as the graveyard's committed on the right-hand side. And there are the Spear Goblins to try and counteract that one and deal with damage to the skeletons that we can spawn from the graveyard. Yeah, it feels like uh, Lucas just went for a last chance saloon. He knows that the rocket is being cycled. He's going to take the Princess Tower on the right there. Easy first game with that rocket cycle log bait there for Bale. And uh, he will gladly take that first uh, victory. Yeah, once that rocket came into play and we knew that it was going to be cycled through, the timer was also set a little bit more extreme uh, for Lucas because it's not about the game time, it's about how fast can that rocket come into the hand and he wasn't making enough headway with his own assault. It ultimately left to his own demise. We're going to be jumping into game two as fast as we can to keep the action coming. Yeah, we are just waiting to jump into that second game. Obviously, uh, Lucas and Bale, they are practice partners. They know each other incredibly well. Um, two, both regions producing incredibly good Clash Royale players. A lot of, I've actually, I always find that Spanish-speaking regions just produce incredibly good Clash Royale players for some reason. It's just some sort of like, uh, some sort of quirk maybe of the of the communities that exist in those uh, in those regions. But they always, always seem to produce excellent world-level uh, Clash Royale players. And you can see already Bale off to a good start of the Barbarian Barrel, just to kind of scope out what's going on and the Dark Prince immediately responded by Lucas. 
There's a Battle Healer in this deck for Bale that could lead to some tricky situations with the beatdown. Might see an Elixir Golem thrown into the mix as well, giving some indication of what we expect to see. Goblin Hut's been played quite a lot, kid, and was recently buffed on this patch, so it does spawn those Spear Goblins on death, which is why we're seeing a lot more of that being played recently. Yeah, based on what I'm seeing right now, this looks like a classic Elixir Golem beatdown deck. Um, all of the cards you see here that have been played so far are just kind of very meta. Uh, elixir goblins so i'm imagining that is what we're going to see from bale this time round. nothing too out of the ordinary um you might even run electro dragon as well um I, so I'm, I, I'm very much expecting that to be the case here the earthquake coming out to try and deal with the buildings as well getting a bit of damage onto that spear goblin hut and uh, honestly in a good spot right now for bale you'd say yeah, he shouldn't have been able to get away with that much free damage onto the tower, and he's holding a lot of cards when it comes to Elixir. Battle Healer's going to be there to shut down the Dark Prince on the left-hand side with the assistance of the Princess Tower as well. A lot of burnt Elixir, or leaked Elixir more accurately for Lucas as he was deciding what to do, but he's going to commit that Baby Dragon on the left-hand side and look to clear out this Battle Healer. So we haven't seen that one big push from Bale yet, which I imagine is going to be triggered when we hit double Elixir time. Yeah, you really want to uh, work with a backline Elixir Golem, and then you build up behind it the classic beatdown play. Uh, I'm wondering whether we're seeing a form of beatdown coming out from Lucas. It's difficult to tell because he hasn't really shown his entire hand so far. Um, but, I, I mean, I, again, we might sort of find that out once we get to double Elixir. Again, they're just kind of like feeling each other out at this point There's in time. There's that Golem. Yeah, there we go. The Elixir Golem on the back here. I'm imagining this is going to be followed up very nicely and very quickly. It is a classic Golem beatdown, as we've just seen that dropped for Lucas here. So Golem versus Elixir Golem beatdown. The battle healer behind that Elixir Golem. I'm expecting a big push on this left-hand side coming out uh, from Bale. The saving grace for Lucas is that he will be able to get that Goblin Hunt back online in time to draw some of the aggro, but not fast enough to stop that Elixir Golem connecting. Tornadoes being traded to draw them back in. And there's that connection on the left-hand side. The Elixir Golem going to be chipping away. The Dark Prince cannot deal the damage in time. And Bale will go 2-0 in this series. Yeah, I don't think there's any way that he can respond in 20 seconds. He has got a small Elixir advantage, but he's got to work through so many units to get there. An easy win for Bale to take him 2-0 in this series and he's really getting the upper hand over his trading partner, Lucas. So we'll have a match points ready to go for you as soon as we can. So Elixir Golem combo coming in with a Battle Healer. Didn't have to use anything, waited until double Elixir time and played the game to perfection. Lucas, unfortunately, unable to get anything going with the beatdown of his own. So that will ultimately lead to Bale's victory and going 2-0 in the series. Can he make it 3-0, though, Trid? Mm. That's the question. That would be very, very, very uh, strong showing from our uh, player from Spain. Again, uh, a, a really, really celebrated player, as we've kind of talked about. He's, he's, We've got our eyes on him in this particular tournament. Ah, here we go. A bit more classic, Trid. It looks like it's going to be Hog Cycle <laughs> coming out from Lucas. I was expecting to see this at some point, and uh, it looks like Lucas is just going to say, nope, let's go, Hog Cycle. We're about to play. Yeah, a lot of spam going to go on the right-hand side now that he's picked his target, the Battle Healer, coming out yet again. Again, for Bale, could be seeing that Elixir Golem. That's a Sparky, I believe. No, it's not a Sparky on the right-hand side. It's going to be looking to shoot away at this Skeleton Giant. The Firecracker also here to clear the path. Bandit should be able to leap across the river. Catch him out of the recoil jump. And now set his sights on the turret. Great drop of the Goblins to draw the aggro and stop the tower from getting hit. Yeah, again, nothing uh, major. The, the, the Hog obviously doing a huge amount of damage at the start, though. Again, you're just looking for the kind of chip damage. Lots of Elixir being leaked, but it's just buying some time for Electro Wizard to come down. We'll deal with uh, Baby Dragon pretty nicely as Baby Dragon should just about draw aggro from the Princess Tower, so that was well-timed from Lucas. Easy little play there to deal with an expensive unit. There's that log to hopefully mean that the E-Wiz will take care of the Musketeer. We'll at least drop it into death range with a couple of shots of the Princess Tower on the right-hand side. Battle Healer being committed. Still two cards unknown for both of our competitors. The Ram Raider being dropped is going to lock up this Hog Rider and make it impossible for him to make that connection. And the Mini Pekka seems to be a response to shut down the Russia coming in from Bale. Yeah, here comes the Battle Healer as well, just pushing in defense. With the cannon, just going to start to move through now. Battle Healer taking a bit of the aggro. Should be able to uh, buy a bit of time. I don't expect a huge amount of tower damage coming through here as the, uh, the skeleton will just absorb the majority of the damage. Take that cannon down and should be able to move on just a little bit further forward. So Bale's probably going to be having that last card be the Elixir Golem again. I imagine potentially here. I'm waiting for that one minute to drop it with the right push. 
but he has to deal with the responses coming in from the right hand side so firecracker being used good answer Oops. to the bandit fireball being spent to try and burn that log as well to shut down the bandit but they're gonna have to put a unit on the field and e wiz seems to be the answer for that with fireball being spent that means we're not getting any kind of beat down with this one king no it, it looks like a more mid-range um cycle with ram raider again just looking for chip damage maybe finish off with fireball towards the end uh, and you can see now they're going to commit pretty heavily you just put a bit of uh, put a bit of uh, 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 units in front of the cannon and try and move it forward to ch chip away at those turrets and uh, that's what i'm expecting here from uh, from bale i'm waiting for the last card from lucas though that's the what that's what we're waiting to see whether it's a response card or whether it's an integral card part of this deck i'm not sure he's keeping a hold of it for a long time he's waiting for the right time to use it ram raid uh, sorry hold hog rider not getting the connection needed for the time being but this uh this deck this um ram rider cycle deck coming out for bale not as impactful as we saw from him in previous games the fireball being committed to clear out the firecracker just does not want to let that unit get into play here no i mean it can be quite dangerous when left alone so i, I understand the urgency coming out from bale to make sure that it doesn't move any further forward especially with the protection of something like the giant skeleton and again using that giant skeleton as an absorbing method to allow it to take most of the damage and again that ram rider coming through Hog not able. Oh, Hog is able to connect a couple of hits here, but I don't think it's going to get a huge amount of work slowly, done. Slowly though, the Ram Raider being his vice yet again, hitting him with the bowlers and slowing everything down. Mini Pekka able to chomp through the cannon quite easily, and also the same for the battle healer. So the health advantage is in favor of Lucas. This is such a slow burn kid, and that if this goes on much longer, Lucas will just get the overtime victory. Yeah, definitely feels that way. They've got responses for everything. I don't think either of them have got a card that is going to suddenly turn the tides of this battle. It just feels like it's going to be up to someone making a mistake or a really, really uh, sort of high-level play or an overcommittal of Elixir on one side. But yeah, it doesn't really feel like um, either of them are going to get a huge push on, on either of the sides, really. So there's just the responses all round for both players. I like what Bale's trying to do though. He's switching it up on the left-hand side to try and draw some aggro away from the right, relieve some pressure, but also potentially catch Lucas off guard and get the damage needed. It only needs one tower to be the lowest HP, but it's been dropped down to 452 on the right-hand side with 30 Ooh. seconds remaining. And now his left is under threat from the Skeleton Giant. And it's not going to happen at all. The Earthquake comes through. Lucas is still alive in this series. Yeah, really nice play down the left-hand side there. He realized that it was a big commit from Bale on the right, uh, and he used a Hog Rider, which drew a lot of resources over to the right-hand side, and that allowed him to just push through with that giant skeleton. And the Mini Pekka, which did a huge amount of damage. That was the last card that was in um, Lucas's deck. Uh, Mini Pekka doing a huge amount of damage on that left-hand side, especially left uncontested. It can be a real, a real pain to deal with, and he gets his first win of this series. It's an all-important win because he's still at match point. Bale just needs to win this one game to go through to the semi-finals and knock Lucas out of the competition. Ice Golem being committed on the left-hand side, so not showing the cards too early with this one. Yeah, Ice Golem is obviously one of those cards that's mainly used as bait. I'm having a look here with the Musketeer. I'm, I'm imagining with the Musketeer being shown, this is a classic hog cycle from, from Bale, you, you would imagine? Just because of those two I, cards. Are, I would... Those I was two cards say, are pretty common, right? One, yeah, 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 those, those two cards are pretty one. common. Um, trying to work out what's going on for the side of Lucas. It might... With Ice Wizard and Knight, that could be a Splash Yard coming in as well, I think. Yeah, Ice Wizard and Knight, they're, they're pretty common. Um, especially if you've got that... that, that. Yeah, we got Baby Dragon as well. So this is probably going to be a Splash Yard. Royal Hogs being used in this bait as well. So maybe not so classic. <laughs> yeah, throwing a, throwing a bit of a spin on what we consider classic there, kid. And going to get some good damage into the Barb Hut and cut down the amount of spawns that one will get. So on the left-hand side, going to get the Scatter Gun being fired at the Baby Dragon as well. Yeah, I think this might just be a Royal Hogs base deck then instead. And, you know, obviously just uh, instead, instead of using... Your classic hog rider, you're going in with the Royal Hogs is the majority uh, of, of push onto those uh, individual turrets. And you can see uh, Mini Pekka Heal Spirit as well, a card that we see get seen, uh, get seen a decent amount of play. Um, it actually combos really nicely with the Royal Hogs because if you can get that heal off and they can get a lot of damage onto the turret, it can keep them alive for a significant amount of time. And look at this, Lucas just doesn't seem to have an answer to the chip damage coming down. Huge damage going onto his left-hand side Princess Tower. He's not even resolved it yet. The saving grace will be for him that his King Tower is now active as well, thanks to that tornado. So he will have some extra reinforcements on the defense when it comes around to the next offense from Bale. 
yeah, nicely earthquake though. Good response to uh, any kind of building placement in the middle. He's going to start to chip away at damage there. That's the only chip damage that he's going to have that is uh, essentially non-unit based. Log can sometimes get a tiny amount of damage done, but yeah, there's no there's no huge amount of chip damage coming out from this uh, this deck from Bale. So not expecting any kind of like fireball cycle to finish this off right here. He's going to have to do it the hard way by just shoveling units down towards that left hand side tower. He's he's going for the bait. He's On baited the right out. He's got side. A huge yeah, Royal Hogs going in with the mini Pekka behind it as well. Barb Hut being committed in such a dangerous position. It will get the spawns in play, but there's so much damage going on to the right-hand side. Either turret or either tower is vulnerable to another assault from Bale to get the win here. Yeah, Bale just using that hunter, just clearing out that left-hand side push. The Royal Hogs come down once more. Big commit. Nice Barb Barrel. Buys a bit of time here, and the Earthquake will do a good job. Just needs to get a couple of hits. On that left-hand side, a bit of an overcommit with the graveyard now coming down. This is a good counter-attack by Lucas. It has to be. This the graveyard was not going to be played at all in regular time. He's having a lot of damage on the left-hand side. The one punch may be enough, but there's a good response coming in. Ice Wizard more interested with that mini Pekka than the tower. So he's going to have to try and stay alive, cycle through these poisons. But the Royal Hogs and the mini Pekka are going in. The Barb Hut will only last for so long, Keenan. And once that's gone, the Earthquake also doing the deed. 7 HP and one tap was all it takes. Bale will go through to the semi-finals. Yeah, and easy as you like it, Bale got caught out in the third game, but the fourth, he gets the win. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm happy to see a bit of cycle coming back in. It was, yeah. it was nice to see that come, when we really just saw a load of beatdown in the last quarterfinal. Did you miss the Royal Hogs, this scoundrel? Uh, they used to be one of my favorite cards when I, when I was playing. So yeah, I, I, I like Royal Hogs. Uh, I also just love classic uh, like Expo Cycle. I love classic um, Hog Rider Cycle as well. So uh, like Cycle decks, I feel like some of the most skill-based decks in the game. I really feel with beatdown decks, you just got to wait for a certain amount of elixir. You just slam your big units down and hope sometimes. But with, with Cycle, it really takes a lot of skill to get those individual chip, uh, chip plays off. So I, I love Cycle decks in general. So it's really nice to see them played here by Bale. You know what, Scoundrel, just because there might be some new people or new people to Clash Royale watching, can you define what a cycle desk is for us? Most of the time, like low cost cycle decks like Hog Rider, you, you're generally cycling um, low cost units, low elixir units to get to your, your your hogs or your royal hogs and they just get slammed down. They run across the river. They run directly at the opponent's tower. The point of cycle decks is not to get a complete th three crown win. The point of a cycle deck is to usually get a one a one princess tower win. Uh, you usually have a lot of defensive, low cost defensive options in there that allow you to deal with any push from your opponents. And then when you see an opening, you just throw down like a hog rider or those royal hogs like we saw there from Bale. And and you're attempting to get just that single um, crown win, usually just eking it out in overtime. And it seems like Bale favours classic control dex trid. Are you surprised that the old decks do so well still? The old decks live up. If it's good, you don't have to improve too much about it. The new cards haven't really been game changers and smashing up the old guard of these deck types. Rather, they've been complementing them and just augmenting them ever so slightly. So we haven't had that um, cataclysmic event that's really shifted up the meta. We've only seen slight tweaks along the way. Let's jump into the first game here to Juicy One versus Neki Lick, and we will see. Looks like immediately straight up Lava Hound coming down. That's very rarely played out of a Lava Loon deck, so I'm assuming uh, it's maybe Three Musketeer beatdown versus Lava Loon, but it's super early on to see these cards go down onto the field. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there, X. I mean, absolutely, just like big, big elixir cards going down at a very early stage is uh, quite the rarity here. And um, yeah, this is uh, already off to an exciting start for, for me. Um, keen to see what these players have brought uh, 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 alongside that in their decks here. And um, yeah, surprised we didn't see like a, a big a sort of elixir leak for a good minute. Uh, just getting straight off to the action, really. Yeah, well, uh, again, they maybe are going to be looking for their prime opportunities to just land some of their units. It's going to be the Inferno Dragon coming down at the back here for the Juicy One. Not looking to uh, to combo much high elixir together, just trying to throw down and, and seek a response from his opposite number. But that should be yeah. matched pretty nicely by Hunter. Yeah, Miner going down right-hand side, getting some good chip damage on that right-hand side tower. The uh, the Royal Hogs in response are going to get taken down pretty quickly, I would say, by those Barbarians. A bit of damage, but nothing really to, uh, to get too excited over there. No, exactly not. He has managed to get about half HP on that right-hand tower. That will be a sore spot, uh, especially if you see a big Lava Loon combo. 
um, that isn't down the right hand side now, you can expect to potentially lose your princess tower. So I imagine if you are committing resources to one side, uh, as, as did you see one, it's going to have to be down the right hand side bridge. Because if you if you commit left, unless you're going for a three uh, a three crown crown win, you're going to end up losing that right hand side princess tower. Now that you know that royal hogs exist in the opponent's deck. Yeah, I think you're spot on there as well, and, and and also with that earthquake spell there as well, able to continuously chip down. And here we see the Royal Hawks going down. That tower is gonna go down pretty quickly, and now the juicy one on the back foot throws a fireball at the King Tower, activating, but does get a lot of value there, connecting with those three musketeers. It really feels like this is now an all-in play for Juicy One down the right-hand side. He, he knew that he could not answer those Royal Hogs coming down. He's just looking to go, I think, for the complete sweep on the King Tower as well. He's going to have to get through a lot of anti-air. That Hunter is going to do some serious work if left untouched as well. And I really feel like Neki Lick's got the upper hand in this first match so far. Yeah, I think it's spot on there. 20 seconds left as well, and uh, a pretty strong defense. That Hunter has been uh, lingering for such a long time. Oh, it's gone. getting so much value. Great fireball, though. Absolutely so. And uh, 10 seconds left. I think this could be in the bag here. Yeah, well, the Hermine is coming down. There's the Dark Prince going to be able to deal with it. He's managed to bait the Inferno Dragon with that Ice Golem over to the other side, and this should be the secured victory for Neki Lick. And I just feel that that Lava Loom was a little bit improperly timed for the Juicy One. He just unfortunately spent so much Elixir, he had nothing left to deal with those Royal Hogs that got the win. Yeah, tricky position to find yourself in. And uh, I think it was just that damage that went down so early on. And uh, that's always a tricky thing to get and it comes into your mind and plays with your head a little bit almost and you have to kind of like look to respond and unfortunately not quite the match that Juicy One uh, was hoping for there. Well, in counteracting when we're getting to our second game it is going to be waiting out potentially for that double elixir time both of them are just uh, either looking to not make a first move and give anything away or are looking for double elixir for one of their big beatdown decks uh, so i'm expecting maybe just a, a casual minute and a half of a, a very chill no units played Yep, yeah, as is the way with uh, many of these Clash Royale games, but no, it is going to be the juicy one making the first move with a uh, giant skeleton there at the back and uh, the ice wizard coming down. Looks like we're going to get into the uh, swing of things a little bit sooner than we expected. Yeah, well, maybe they were just uh, trying to force the opponent to make a move so they can get a read on their opponent's deck. Giant Skeleton should be enough with the baby dragon to deal with the majority of the responses coming out here. Uh, that is going to be unfortunately unable to make much value out of that uh, that giant skeleton the bomb will not get any any more work done especially on the enemy baby dragon but the inferno dragon comes down so what, what do you think is this going to be a, a sort of a giant skeleton inferno dragon deck what are we expecting from the juicy one here yeah potentially so i mean uh, we could see we got a balloon going down as well we could see maybe a rage or a uh, freeze alongside this so obviously the lumberjack will give us a, a nice amount of value if he goes down here which he does the rage now on that balloon but that's a great use of the tornado there to pull it away from harm and uh great uh, great response there you gotta say yeah, really well timed to Tornado there, actually. And doesn't even activate the King Tower either. He manages to place the bomb just out of range of both the Princess Tower and the King Tower too. Um, maybe would have liked to activate the King Tower, but nonetheless, it was a, a really, really good Tornado coming out from uh, Neki Lick here. He's going to start to use that Miner, or rather, did you see one using the Miner just to try and bait out something? Dark Prince does come down, and it does feel like this is purely a Lumberjack, a Rage-driven deck, like you said. So just using a lot of units that work really well with that Rage mechanic from the Lumberjack, very powerful unit when used correctly and I'm expecting to see a lumberjack come down sometime soon to support uh, the units that have been thrown down by did you see one on this left hand side push yep a very strong push another tornado there I think gonna connect this time with the king tower it does um really really great responses gotta say from Nekilik but I gotta say I do like uh the juicy one's deck and uh, there are some pretty gruesome pushes coming in uh Nekilik's way but a uh, great response a grave uh stone going down there as well uh the response will be a bar barrel there and uh, a pretty comfortable defense yeah, it feels like we're just looking at a classic Graveyard Poison deck coming out from uh, Neki Lick this time round. He's maybe just looking, especially when we get to Double Elixir, just constantly cycle and defend into that particular combo and then again go for the one the one crown win. Um, and I, really, I mean, the Tornadoes have been just so good here. Just I mean, keeping the Rage out of a relevant position, bringing the, the Balloon into an awkward scenario as well. These have been really good defensive plays by Neki Lick and now he's looking to make an offensive play happen. 
Yeah, absolutely. For me, the Tornado has been the key card, really, in uh, Nekilik's deck and just keeping uh, these pushes at bay because they are pretty grueling to look at and um, it, it definitely seems to be like the MVP card. The balloon going down now as well, possibly to be supported with a Lumberjack here. Miner going in as well. Uh, a pretty strong push going in by the Juicy One um, and the Tornado yet again. Bring that balloon away from the tower. It has been such uh, an angel for, uh, for Nekilik there. Yeah, we uh, are still seeing Nicky Lick having to just find those opportunities to use the graveyard. He did see that a lot of Elixir had been committed. This was a nice time to throw that graveyard down and suddenly the Lumberjack used defensively. You never really want that to be the case. Desperation when you're seeing the Inferno Dragon coming down too. Maybe the response is going to be here from uh, Nicky Lick. He's got so much Elixir to work with, I don't really think he's going to have an issue with this push. Yeah, absolutely. I think they're just kind of wisely keeping track on those uh, those elixir levels there, and there's going to be a giant skeleton versus giant skeleton there going off the gravestone going down as well. The lumberjack in response, and uh, a bit of a close bar I think I saw there as well. Um, actually, no, maybe not. Um, look at this. Look, the poison going down the tower. Surely is going to go down. Necky lick then with the response, and uh, it's going to go two up now. Yeah, really excellent defensive use with the tornadoes. I just think they were well timed every single uh, every single one. Uh, and again, the point of that graveyard uh, poison deck is to just look for the opportunity. You you look for your opponent to waste a load of elixir in in defense out of position. And you use the graveyard to chip away. And when you finally get the opportunity, getting that graveyard poison combo to go for the final push, he he just played it perfectly. Yeah, got to say, Nekalik now in a, in a really strong position. Uh, th this could be uh, the final game of this match here. And um, yeah, I mean, the juicy one is uh, going to have to respond here with, with something and uh, definitely change things up as it hasn't been working out for him so far. No, he does drop the uh, Spear Goblin Hut there as well, which uh, he'll deal with very nicely with the Bandit. Going to go over Miner to the left-hand side. Maybe we're looking at some sort of Miner cycle coming up from the Juicy One this time round. Just trying to get that chip damage in with the Miner. Uh, it's going to be the Ram Raider, though, coming in. It does get responded to, but it does give you an indication about what Nekilik is trying to play this time round. Yeah, the perfect response there with the Barbarians shutting that down quickly. And um, yeah, I think that uh, we, we, you might be right. We might be seeing some cycle um, this time round. We haven't seen too much of it today yet so far. Uh, but Just there we see the loop. Lava Hound coming out <laughs> as well. And the Mega Knight, some big cards now being played. And uh, down uh, down goes that, uh, <laughs> that idea then. Uh, we're not going to be looking too much at the uh, cycle now. No, I imagine this is going to be uh, yeah, Lava Loon, maybe in combination with some sort of Mega Knight, Inferno Dragon a deck coming out. Um, I thought when we saw the first four cards, we were just looking at a Ram Rider cycle coming out from Necky Lick, but he has adjusted and teched in some heavier cards, maybe to deal with some of those bigger units. Big push coming in, de gets dealt with nicely with the Snowball. I just think well-used Snowballs are just, just incredibly good to watch. Uh, and Necky Lick did use, their, uh, did use a nice one there to allow him to defend that push. Yeah, it was a lot of value there from that snowball for sure. And um, yeah, it looked like it could have been a lot more damage had uh, had his finger not been on that trigger there. And uh, Bandit coming in now should connect here with the Goblin Hut Miner there as well, just to distract even more so. Uh, Ram right on the right-hand side coming down. But again, that Barbarian response just shutting it down quickly and um, yeah, just cancelling out that, that elixir trade. Uh, push coming in with the Barbarians, uh, Musketeer doing what it can. Poison will come through, but uh, I think it shouldn't be enough to uh, allow any significant damage to come down to this, uh, onto this um, uh, Princess Tower. Uh, the Snowball again, just to clear up those Spear Goblins, which had been kind of uh, building up from the Spear Goblin hut. Ram Rider coming out on the left-hand side. It looks like Nekilik is changing up his plan of attack. Very little elixir actually from Nekilik to deal with it here. He is going to drop the Musketeer. That might not be enough. There's a big push coming out from the Juicy One and uh, I feel like Nekilik is starting to struggle ever so slightly in terms of his defensive capabilities. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right there, X. Uh, I did like that play from Deducey One, just choosing to leave uh, and not place those uh, those barbarians down for the uh, for the ram ride on that left hand side, and opting to go down with the lava hound instead. And look at this now: the more chip damage going in with the poison, and this is looking like a, a really good spot for Deducey One here. Just very aggressive pushes, and and has the poison just to keep chipping away at that right hand side tower.
Exactly. All he needs to do now is make sure he doesn't get caught out by a Mega Knight or a Ram Rider push and just look for big defensive plays using that poison to chip away when he finally gets an offensive maneuver. There is a poison coming out from Neki Lick. He's looking to do the same thing, but he is about a thousand HP behind his opponent when it comes to uh, the poison damage chip away. And that Inferno Dragon does not get taken down. The Mega Knight will get de dealt with. And this really feels like it's going to be the final push coming out from Neki Lick. He should be able to get this Princess Tower, I feel, on this next engage. Yeah, the Miner going in as well, chipping away with the poison, the baby dragon, everything going down, but I don't think it's Oh, so quite. close. <laughs> so, so close. Um, but definitely only a matter of time before that poison is back in cycle, and I think the juicy one is not out of this one yet. Yeah, he drops the snowball. He drops the poison. He knows that he's going to get this uh, this princess tower this time round, and he will take that one crown victory, biting back against Neki Lick in this quarterfinal. Things are heating up then. Uh, two to one in favor of Neki Lick. The juicy one just showing that it's uh, it's all still to play for here. And uh, the pressure's definitely on, but that deck definitely seemed to work out uh, better for him in that round. Yeah, we're going to jump into the next game here. Again, one win away, Nicky Lick from advancing to the semi-finals and immediately drops the Spear Goblins. No waiting this time round, no beat down. Uh, did you see one? Another Lava Hound coming out. So again, uh, another Lava Hound orientated deck, whether it's Lava Loon, whether it's something similar to what we saw previously, I don't know, but he's definitely favoring decks that utilize that big, beefy flying fortress. That's a lot of damage early on, though, being considered on the right-hand side. The, the, uh, the response of the Inferno Dragon is going to shred the Lava Hound. And for me, a bit of a, a bit of a shaky star here for the juicy one. I mean, if you look at that deficit, the Miner coming in now and look at the emotes. They know that there is problems on the horizon. Look at that damage. Only 1,500 remaining there for the juicy one and not the start he was hoping for. No, he's running um, skeleton uh, skeleton barrel as well, so he's going to be able to just like dive that in. He's, he's just looking for that chip damage. The Inferno Tower coming down is the major uh, answer to some of these beefier units like the Lava Hound and the Inferno Dragon. He looks like he's got a deck that could potentially counter out the juicy one here. If he plays it correctly, I feel like he has a small deck advantage going into this, and um, I definitely feel like he's in the driving seat in this game so far. Yeah, it does seem like Nekalik has got all the answers to these cards. The, uh, the Miner going in again. The response is with the uh, Barbarians and this time a Snowball. And I think that will be definitely the card to save uh, for that, uh, for that uh, those Skeletons going in. But um, yeah, again, like this is a lot of pressure now on the Juicy One. And uh, Nekalik can just keep using that poison um, every time that uh, Goblin Hut goes down and just keep chipping away. What do we think uh, the final card is for Neki Lick? I, for me, it looks like some sort of like Mega Knight base deck. Maybe a Mega Knight coming out at the end here, but I, I, it's difficult to tell. Um, he has got one card that we haven't seen, as has Dejuicy One. Actually losing his tower on the right-hand side here. It would have to be a big play for Dejuicy One to make it back. Good games already coming out from Neki Lick. Don't count your chickens before they've hatched, mate, because you could end up getting fought back here. The Inferno Tower already dropping. It is not over till it's over. We still have a minute left to play. Yeah, the mind games have begun and uh, it, it can often play a, a tactical advantage to get inside the head of your opponents and we'll have to see whether the juicy one is going to take that diss as down go uh, some more barbarians to, uh, to try to defend this. But uh, the juicy one is saying good game. He does seem to be under the impression that this one could be over for him in this tournament. Yeah, he uh, unfortunately has now lost a bit of ground on the right-hand side, so pushing down the right-hand side with his uh, with his uh, Lava Hound is going to be harder because they can drop an offensive Inferno Tower like you just saw there, although the Inferno Dragon is making his way over to the right-hand side with the Miner still there. Oh, I just don't think it's going to happen. He's only got 10 seconds and has, uh, with Elixir to work with, but it's going to take too long to get anything over. It looks like Neki Lick is going to take this semi-final 3-1 versus the Juicy One. I mean, he didn't take the semi-final. Oh. He did take the quarter-final, though, in Scoundrel. And you've just flashed forward to the future because Neki Lick has made it through to the semi-finals. He is going to be playing the winner of our next quarter-finals. But before we get to that one, of course, we've got to just discuss what just happened, gentlemen. I think Neki Lick there, he seemed to have you guessing, in fact, with that last deck, Scoundrel. 
Yeah, I mean, what I what I like about the Neki Lick's play is I really, really have to compliment his defensive work. I think um, he was very, very good at utilizing the minimal minimum amount of resources required to deal with anything that, that he was being thrown at him. Specifically, I want to kind of look back to that. I think it was the second or third game where his tornado usage, that single spell, every time getting huge impact on the uh, the, the rage uh, balloon deck that we saw coming out from the juicy one. Yeah, I just think Neki Lick very, very well practiced on the defensive work, and he just found some good counterattacking opportunities playing for the chip damage, playing for, um, you know, those those single sweeps to get the Princess Tower when it counted. So, yeah, I'm very impressed with Nicky Lick in this uh, quarterfinal. Well, there's Woody, our expert analysist. Analysis, I just said. I'm making up words here. Why not? It's Clash Royale. It's all fun. But what will our expert analysis... I said it again. He's an analyst. His name's Woody. Let's head over to him to see what he thought of our third quarterfinal. Let's take another look, Frankie. Neki Lick caught fire in game one, starting the match with a risky Three Musketeers drop behind his King Tower. He piled on even more damage with Royal Hogs that eventually caught the Juicy One out of cycle and without any response. Instead, he pushed all in with a Lava Hound strike that was unrelenting, but eventually cut short by a hard counter hunter. Next up, we saw the Juicy One seize the initiative with an innovative Lumberloon deck that just couldn't find its way around the Goblin Huts and Tornadoes played by Nekilik. With giant skeleton bombs exploding all over the map, chaos reigned, but Nekilik was its master. With carefully timed graveyard attacks, he brought DJO to death's door on more than one occasion, delivering the killing blow in the last minute. Hot off his first two wins, Neki Lick began Game 3 in confident fashion, dropping a tower to half hit points in the first couple of minutes with Goblin Stabs and Bandit Jabs. But the Juicy One caught on soon after, finding the perfect counters in a band of Barbarians to shut down Ram Riders and an Inferno Dragon to burn up the Mega Knight. Neki kept in the fight, but he had peaked too early and soon found his tower in shambles. The final game saw Neki Lick really put the squeeze on the Juicy One with a minor poison control deck that incinerated DJO's Lava Hound. He was willing to soak some early damage in the hopes of a massive counterattack, but DJO never found the right chance to swing for the bleachers. And so the game was over before Double Elixir time had even started, and Neki Lick would be the one moving on to the semifinals. Congratulations to them both. Take it away, Frankie. Thank you so much, Woody. Now we only have one more quarterfinal to go before we find out who our top four will be. And our final matchup is between Kota Wanatabi from Japan and Victor Sia from Colombia. So they're poles apart in terms of geography, but will they be poles apart in terms of competition? Oh, do we know anything about this matchup and these players? Uh, well, one thing for certain is going to be pretty close, I would imagine, at this stage of the competition. But uh, I'll be honest, I'm not overly familiar with these two players, but um, I'm expecting good things. And what about you, Trish? Do you know anything about Clash Royale in Japan, for example? I can't say that I do, Frankie, but that's one of the better things about this tournament is that we are constantly exposed to new players we wouldn't usually be found by. So I'm excited to see what comes out. I'm going into this one blind. Me too. Well, let's let's uh, get some vision on this matchup and let's head into our final quarterfinal. All right, thank you very much, Frankie. Me and Ark will take care of this one. So we got our quarterfinal matchup. It's Victor going up against Kota Watanabe. But as you see in the game, you're going to see his name as Hajime. Yep, just looking to cycle through then, get the uh, get the right cards in play. Uh, no waiting around as we've seen in the previous rounds this time around. Um, looks like some pretty small cards. We can see some cycle uh, potential here, Trent. Yeah, there's a Tesla tower coming out, so it's going to be interesting. I think that's just to cycle that through. There wasn't really a demand for that right now. It does have some longevity on the field, uh, relatively safe. It wasn't in response to anything, so I think he's trying to find the right combo to attack with. As he's just sending everything across the field with no clear, distinct objective for at present. Yeah, at the moment it's just uh, just cycling around really and uh, not really any big plays. Oh, we are going to see the Expo. Okay then, so this has just got a bit more interesting and um, that's going to be definitely the uh, the card that uh, is, is connected to the tower there as well. Baby Dragon is going to connect and take it down, but uh, a lot of early damage then considered by Victor. 
the Hajime or Koda Watanabe in that early kill, early, not kill, early damage into the tower more accurately arc. And so now we know what's going to be played around. It's also Victor has to be mindful of that. His final card still up for debate. The Exo is going to be played further back. That's easily going to be able to deal with that Goblin Hut across the river, freeing up the Ice Golem to go straight to the tower. What do you think that other card will possibly be that Victor's holding back? And uh, is it going to be something like a, a, a tanky card, like a Golem or something to kind of like overpower or, or, or maybe like a graveyard or something, Nitrid? Could potentially be the graveyard. I wouldn't set my sights on that entirely. We've got one minute left, so I have a feeling we're going to find out the answer to that relatively soon as we enter double elixir time. We've got two Expos on the field just chipping away at that turret. The poison's been deployed as well as the baby dragon to end that duration faster. So it looks like Kota is mixing up his targets for the time being and not committing to one lane. Yeah, definitely seeing a very interesting deck here then. Um, uh, very different from what we've seen already today uh, by Koto Watanambi. And um, yeah, I'm just kind of really surprised to see uh, the Expo here. And uh, it does seem to be working out very, very well for him, however. Got to look at the, the amount of damage that has been done. But nevertheless, quite a close game so far. Placement from Koto, able to get that Goblin Hunt regardless of what happens. So he's still going to find value even if he doesn't make the connection. Just units coming through right now for Victor, who has been chipping away as well. He's still definitely not out of this round. He's going to commit to the right-hand side with the poison to carry on finding that damage. We're now into sudden death. Next tower to be taken will decide who gets to walk away with the first game. Pretty decent push on the right-hand side. Just double uh, expos there, trying to clear the way to get towards the right-hand side tower there. The poison in response and just both players gradually chipping away. It's incredibly close. The connection's been found by that Expo arc. It's going to potentially drop it down into triple digits because it's not been stopped. So that's a clear advantage for Kota now on the right-hand side with the Expo. He just needs to find one more connection and he can potentially seal the deal. Yeah, as we still have not seen that final card from Victor or actually having said that Kota Watanabe, both players here holding back and I, I gotta wonder whether that is gonna make a difference as we approach uh, the final minute of overtime here. I don't think it will. They're gonna go and cycle through their spells right now. Fireball being connected to the right hand side. So we get that expo in connection to the right princess tower. That could be the downfall for them. Tesla getting nice clearance over across the river. And the expo connection clear out units. The graveyard coming out for Victor. So this was this truck card in the pocket. One big push to hopefully seal the deal. We've got the poison to reinforce it and they're going to keep chipping away the Tesla and also the Expo should be able to deal damage. But he's got a connection on the left hand side with that other Expo drawing the attention and he's going to use that fireball to make sure that it keeps on trucking along. Trying to chip it down into the triple digits. Getting it to below 500 HP and there's a good game coming out. There's no response and Kota Watanabe will take game number one. Wow, the Expo then just coming in uh, so incredibly clutch. A good job of, of tanking as well with that Ice Golem. And uh, got to wonder, are we going to see the Expo making another appearance? Or uh, is Kosano Watanabe going to be continuing to mix things up and keep us on our toes here? Well, we've seen a lot of people cycle through different decks. I wouldn't bank on him playing the same thing twice, but the Skeletons to kick things off and happy to burn through the Elixir until the Goblin Huts are traded on either side. Goblin Hut being very versatile right now, that could mean a number of things, so we'll have to see how the cards reveal and show the deck down the line. Yep, uh, the Goblin Hut here is uh, quite a good uh, card currently in the meta. Quite uh, a lot of pro players are opting to go towards it. Uh, Baby Dragon on both sides as well. Looking like we could be seeing uh, similar decks here. I'd imagine that uh, Kota Watanabe has brought the poison as well, but we'll have to wait and see as uh, these players continue to cycle through. So Kata, Kota Watanabe is on the red hand side this time. He's already shown that poison. I'm thinking that we're going to see a splash yard deck coming out from him this time around. And it's probably going to be something similar for Victor. Uh, maybe not necessarily the splash yard itself, but it's going to be a lot. I don't know, it could actually be the splash yard here as well. It could be a mirror in terms of archetypes, but different ways of executing the comp. 
Dark Prince should get taken down here by the Queen Tower just before making contact with the uh, the Barb Hut. And we are going to see that poison going down for both players. So again, uh, keep an eye on that in terms of the rotation because uh, it's going to make a big impact here as uh, both players trying to whistle down those left-hand side towers. Well, now they're pressing on to meet each other in the mid. I'm certain that both of them have a graveyard, so this is definitely going to be one of those one-tower game arcs. I don't think it's going to go all the distance. And there's that first graveyard being pulled by Victor on the left. The tornado used off the actual spawner just to make sure that they're cleared up and a connection has been made by the baby dragon. It's going to be distracted by the barbarian, but the skeleton's got about 500 or so damage into that turret, dropping it into the 1500 range. Yeah, a good tornado, but again, I think that uh, that graveyard there just uh, it's getting a lot of damage, and I think it took uh, Cosmo Watsonomi a little bit by surprise. Um, and I think that that is a really good card for me to be able to go. And we're going to see a return <laughs> graveyard as well. So yep. both players holding back on that one. And um, yeah, th that's going to definitely make a big, big outcome here for one of these two players here. The Splash Yard's in a very good position to actually deal with Splash Yard decks because those graveyards are going to be pulled up and dealt with Tornado. You've got the Poison, you've got the AoE from the Baby Dragon. A lot of answers to deal with them, so it's going to be very negligible, the difference between them. It's just down to the execution, and this time around, Victor has absolutely manhandled Koto on that left-hand side. Oh, huge damage. That tower now only on 382 HP. Uh, it's one Poison and Graveyard away from just being absolutely decimated here. As we approach sudden that death, graveyard? it's all over now. Victor takes it. Yeah, Victor's going to equalize in the series, so that means we're going over to game number three with an even score. Still meaning we're going to guarantee to get four maps out of this one arc. So Splash Yard being used by both players. They don't know what decks are going to be rolled into when it comes to each round. So just by chance, they had similar decks, but different ways of executing them. Yeah, absolutely. And um, definitely, um, I mean, the expo could come back around, but I, I think you're right. I think we might not see that make a return for a while as we uh, maybe see something more like a, a beatdown or, or something. Uh, Lock being first to go out and uh, Victor just kind of holding back and, and waiting for something more currently from uh, from Kotawasanambe. Log doesn't really scream beat down to me, so I think they're just biding their time. Obviously, you're going to get that out early. So the guard's coming out as well. Nice split at the back. It will demand some kind of response. I believe the guards on the two side will be able to get some chip damage into the tower as they're still continuing to leak Elixir. Earthquake being committed as well. Bar barrel trade on the left-hand side, so not massively showing the hand, but there's the ice golem as we start to get a better picture of what coat is going to be rolling out with. Yeah, very small uh, elixir costs going down, the miner going down as well. Uh, it doesn't quite yeah. connect, a really, really fast return as well from Victor there with the battle healer going down. And um, yeah, that was a very, very quick reaction there to ensure that that miner didn't connect. So it seems like we're going to have a minor poison at least for Kota Watanabe. Going with the control deck archetype. It will deal with the battle healer. Now that tells me that we might be expecting a golem to come out at some point from Victor. Who does appear to be running that slightly heavier deck. So it's all about the difference that Kota can make before we enter that beatdown territory of double elixir time. Yeah, that's going to be the, the time to absolutely go in for those big elixir cost cards. And down goes uh, the electric dragon there on the uh, the minus. And damage is dealt, but uh, yeah, interesting to see the electric dragon making an appearance here. And uh, definitely uh, expecting to see something tankier to, to go in front of that as well to, to capitalize on that damage. E-Dragon's really good at supporting beefier units who get swarmed uh, by the low HP units because they will see the lightning is going to arc and it makes it very difficult um, to deal with that as good clearance. There's the bomb tower being deployed in the middle. The Elixir Golem finally coming out with the battle healer as expected at the one minute push time. The Miner ignoring all of that, digging under the surface and going for the left hand tower. Earthquake trying to brute force this Elixir Golem through. Thankfully the guards are there to buy more time but the E-Dragon is incoming. Yeah, I like the kite there uh, being used to create effect by Cutter was number, but here we see the Electric Golem going in and the Electric Dragon with support behind it. It's uh, looking like a pretty good push for me from Victor, although his tower is so low now at 756, the pressure really is on now to make an impact on this uh, left-hand side here. 
as long as Victor can get Kota Watanabe to spend resources to trying to defend. He won't be able to cycle through the poison in the miner. In fact, you watch the miner taking the long way to get there and Battle Healer will deal with it. But there's no pressure on the left-hand side. That opens up Kota to be able to hit this tower with that minor poison combo because the Elixir Golem won't get there in time. And now Overtime is in effect as well, Ark. He doesn't need to defend if he can kill that tower first. Yeah, exactly spot on there. Kota Watanabe can just literally keep cycling that poison spell as long as he doesn't overcommit on the defense and has that elixir cost to spend then uh, this one looks like it's definitely under control for Kota Watanabe as the minor connects on the left hand side now getting continuous ship damage and the, and the poison going poison down as well. Poison being deployed as well dropping it into triple digits right now the elixir golem may get the connection but the earthquake was the icing on the cake. Kota Watanabe goes 2-1 in the series. Great plays there, and uh, definitely enjoying the uh, the variety that we're seeing from uh, from Kota Watanabe's decks here as we go in. Uh, so potentially the the final game here, if he continues this reign across the uh, the maps of Victor, and uh, Victor definitely needing now then to respond. We're jumping into game four just as fast as we did with number three. It looks like being leaked. Maybe they're going to try and match it. But there's the Goblin Hut on the right-hand side. Earthquake already coming out. Victor may be running with another control-type deck. Um, as his cards progress, we'll bring you more information on that. But the, my, the Knight coming out makes it seem like it's all the more likely we could be going over to some kind of minor poison deck yet again. Potentially still even the Splash Yard. Yeah, I think you could be right. Some low-cost cards going down and the Musketeer will be... Uh Pretty able to take out the uh, the flying machine pretty easily. The uh, oh, here we go. See some raw hogs coming in as well, and that is a great response there with the bomb tower and just the log for a bit of security. But um, yeah, some some quick turnarounds and a lot of cards shown there in that uh, in that interaction just now. So we're looking for uh, Kota to be able to cycle through and find the right time to get those hogs to find the connection. In the meantime, though, we're relying on that splash yard to just overwhelm the defenses when he's not paying attention. So it's who can get the better cycle is going to decide a lot of how this map goes. But there's the hog rider going in himself. So he's going to try and find a connection. Paul will activate his king tower, making it even harder to get units to find the, the time to deal the damage needed. I've got to say, I really like the timing on that hog and it just allowed the, the queen tower to take down the uh, the back with any without any elixir spent, but unfortunately a great tornado pulling it into the king tower, and that is definitely going to give an advantage to Kota Watanabe in terms of his defense. Yeah, so no poison, no graveyards to be found here. It's looking like it's all about cycling out with the hog, baiting out the spells as well. The goblin hunt going to reinforce the left hand side as the ice wizard goes on to the right. Knight should be able to catch that one before any damage is happening. They're gonna be becoming more resources on the right-hand side with the Musketeer. He's happy with the Spear Golem. Deal some damage as Hog will come charging down the left-hand side. Barbar with the knockback. He'll get damage in, but it will also have to trade away some eight power HP. Nice snowball reacting to the Royal Hugs will slow down the retreat and allow time for that bomb tower to get online. The earthquake will shred through them, but a lot of units finding their way to the right-hand side and the left is a straight little piggy hits it up and starts munching on the tower. <laughs> <laughs> that one little piggy went to market and got the valley. That tower taking a lot of damage. And again, the response we're seeing to the uh, to the hog ride of that tornado, just stopping it from connecting in the bomb tower. It does seem like Victor has some great responses, though, to what are pretty gnarly pushes from uh, Kotawanda. I'm not going to lie. Ice Wizard able to get free damage on. Nothing drawing his eye up. So we see the knight and the hog on the right hand side. Tornado yet again, always the definitive response. Earthquake chipping away as we enter into overtime. Hog only finding one love tap that time around as the rural hogs will come charging down into Victor's territory. Bomb tower, great reaction just on the edge of the earthquake range as the rural hog will make a connection on the right hand side. Ice Wizard is coming in for support, but the log will delay it only a fraction longer. The damage will still find a way. These two players, I've got to say, do seem very evenly matched. They do seem to always have an answer for each other. And uh, we're going to probably see a tornado again to pull back this hog. We are. And uh, at the moment, it is definitely Kota Watanami who has the advantage. But uh, anything can still anything can still change here. Maybe the bomb tower going down again. Exactly. Both these players really know exactly how to respond with every action that is shown. 
but that knight being in play as well helped clear out the royal hogs as well as the absence of the earthquake that time around meant that we were able to stop any of the piggies getting the connection hog rider on the right hand side will go straight over to that goblin hut as earthquake will erode those buildings 994 on the left hand side so that's the only three digit tower we have it has to be the one that Kota goes for the target and he's committing the barrel the earthquake and the piggies to drain draw over to that bomb tower 811 on the left hand side and there's been no real tangible response from Victor to deal Kota any damage yeah 39 seconds left on the clock and uh, Valkyrie trying to tank here for the ice wizard and the uh, flying machine I'm not sure whether it's going to be able to get through as the never hog goes down the left hand side responding on the left hand side with the royal Hogs bomb tower going down, but is it too little too late? I but this time Kota's forcing it all into the same lane arc. He doesn't want the split, he doesn't want to run the risk. He's able to deal with these hogs perfectly. Always has the tornado, always has the goblin hut. Victor can't find a shoe in here, and he's not able to deal the damage to the map. There's 10 seconds remaining. This last hog that he's able to get out has to find something big, but the clock is running down. Three seconds remaining will not find a connection, and Kota Watanabe will go through to our semi finals. Thank you, gentlemen. Kota Watanabe, therefore, booking his place in the semi finals and commiserations to Victor. I want to ask you, gentlemen, about that last game. It was interesting to me with Kota splitting his resources across both lanes. It feels like players haven't been really either comfortable doing that from the other quarterfinals we've seen, or at least their, their tactic has been to focus on just the one Princess Tower arc. Would you say that that's kind of a more unique approach from Kota? It's, it's definitely a good strategy. It means that your opponent has to think about not just one lane and how to sort of distract and kite troops away from that push, but uh, you have to be thinking about two things at once. And uh, I think that was a, a really, really good strategy for him to uh, to apply. And it will be interesting to see whether he takes that strategy to, uh, to the next games to come. One special thank you we'd like to give is to Pay Safecard. Not only do they get involved in MEO national events in Austria, Italy, Greece, Germany, and Spain, but they are giving 1,000 euros prize money to each of our three winners across all three titles. Pay Safecard allows you to shop online safely and securely. For more info, head to paysafecard.com. Welcome back to Red Bull MEO Season 2. This episode is all about Clash Royale and we now know who our final four clashes are. And our first semi-final is going to be between Ivan from Bulgaria and it's going to be Bale from Spain. It's brutal, it's savage and it's now time for our first semi-final of Red Bull MEO Season 2. Well, let's jump into this one, Kieran, nice and fast. Ivan CR versus Bale. And like I said, we both touted Bale as a player to watch when it comes around to this tournament, and we've both seen the strength of him as we've progressed. No sudden movements being made. That is until the Miner comes out for Ivan on the right-hand side. Yeah, immediately just trying to get some chip damage down, maybe uh, playing similarly again. Before, you know, he played a, uh, a, a Hog deck, and I think he had the Miner in that Hog deck previously, so we'll have to see if it's something similar again. Just trying to put pressure on. You're going to see a Cannon Cart coming out here along with the Bandits, so I, I don't think this is a, either of these players playing beatdown decks right now. We're going to be looking at more aggressive aggressive play style from both of them. It's very, very likely to be quite fast paced this game and not really reliant on the big beat down. The cannon cart is locked down outside of range. It's a depressing sight, isn't it, kid? It should be kept at arm's length. Oh, like mate, yeah. The sad, lonely cannon. Yeah, it looks like it's a Ram Rider cycle coming out from Bale. Um, so yeah. again, aggressive, plays very similarly to Hog Cycle. Just looking for that opportunity to get the cannon cart in range, backed up with the Ram Rider. It's the classic one-two combo there. Uh, looking at the side of uh, Ivan, he has gone more aggressive, Trit. He's, he's, he's got away from those control beatdown style decks, mm -hmm. looking like he's playing either a, a log bait uh, or minor chip damage coming out as well. He's going to use the minor defensively here to stop the bandit getting a charge off. You don't see it too often unless you, you absolutely need to do it. And uh, again, Elixir Advantage kind of sitting with Ivan right now, but he does have to respond to this cannon cut. Yeah, it's definitely a minor control deck. They're using the Skeleton Barrel, which was uh, recently buffed on this patch. You trade a little bit of HP for the speed, because that Skeleton Barrel, it comes at you fast now, Kieran. So if you don't have the response, you're going to struggle to clear it out. But Baby Dragon, always a good shout here. The AoE is happy to clear the little skellies once they've dropped onto the field. Yeah, we can see the Battle Healer coming out as well. It's, it's actually something that we saw quite a lot of from Bale. Uh, I really love this card. I think it's obviously one of the newer additions to uh, Clash Royale. I think it's a really excellent addition to lots of different kinds 
lines of builds. And already you can see Bale making an aggressive maneuver down this uh, right-hand side. Log should help clear up some of this, but some damage will actually get thrown onto that right-hand side Princess Tower. Musketeer, when left unchecked, does a surprising amount of damage. Uh, and Ivan already taking a bit of a hit there. Fire, I'm gonna have the Dark Goblin deal with that. Oh no, we're not Fireball being committed to that one. But on the left hand side, that Skeleton Barrel, the Baby Dragon forced to be out there for response. As the Cannon Cart should be dealt with quite handily by the Valkyrie. But a lot of resources being put on the right hand side on this counter attack. Miner forcing the Battle Healer back and the poison being committed on the right hand side. So a lot of that chip damage coming in, but still not enough to equalize where their current pools are sitting. Yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't the most effective poison in the world, but it will start to get some chip damage down on that right-hand side tower. Skeleton Barrel once more again, just looking to land those skeletons. And again, it's a little bit like uh, the Goblin Barrel where you just throw it down to get a couple of hits on that tower. Over the course of your cycles, you're looking to get more and more damage across the game. We are now going to head into Sudden Death, so the first tower going down will secure the victory. The Ram Rider comes out on the left-hand side here for Bale. He's, d he's done this a lot. He does a little cheeky one-two, tries to keep his opponent guessing about the kind of avenue that he's going to take. And again, that combo. Poison the Goblin going to get across now and actually start doing some damage. That, that Skeleton Barrel will start to chunk away. Yeah, it's still keeping the chip damage. It was super unfortunate for Ivan, though. If that bomb tower was just one square over to the left, it would have caught the Ram Raider instead of allowing all of this damage to go through to the left-hand side, creating another option of attack for Bale. If he's coming on the right-hand side. The cannon cart finally got in range, kid, and it's locked on, as has the baby dragon. One more shot should do it. The Ram Raider, no, getting distracted by the tower, but the fireball comes in clutch, and Bale will go ahead and take game number one. Yeah, beautifully played. That's the point of these cycle decks. You're just looking for the chip damage and eventually, especially if you're running things like Rocket or Fireball, you can get that final blow off either with one of your spells or just that rundown with Ram Rider. Good defense from Ivan, but Bale takes the first game in the series. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like the switch up that came into effect there. So we're going to get into game number two, nice and fast. Bale versus Ivan. Any switch ups to these beefier decks could be a nice, refreshing switch up in this series as we've already set the pace quite fast and quite light. Uh, and you can see already the Spear Goblin Hut. It's actually Goblin Hut for Goblin Hut right here. Earthquake yep. coming down. I imagine we're going to see similar decks coming out. Uh, maybe some sort of a Elixir Golem. Uh, these might be more beatdown focused here, Trid. Uh, it's looking like this could actually be uh, potentially a Splash Yard coming out for Ivan. I think uh, maybe something heavier as we alluded to in the pre-game. I mean, of this one, but we have to wait till it's more revealed. Battle, battle healer comes out. It makes yeah. This is just Elixir Golem versus Elixir Golem, I think. Okay. Yeah, so it could we, be a good shot that we see those cards. I think we might actually just have a strict mirror matchup. I think we are literally looking at two of exactly the same. Games. I would be surprised if there was any major differences between the cards used here. As well. E Dragon comes down, tornado through there. That is something that can. No, no. I think that's pretty standard for Elixir Golem actually. So I, I genuinely think we're looking yeah. at a, a, a complete mirror. Yeah, Battle Healer does a lot of good work to fight against that tornado damage. Not only mispositions, but also has the damage element to it. Battle Healer can help a lot of units survive a little bit longer throughout that and maybe still come out the other side of it. The Goblin Huts are going to be trading Chip back and forth. It's Bale who has the slight edge in this one. And the Fireball being committed, trading Elixir for uptime on those structures. Nice uh, Barbarian Barrel there just to clean up those three. And again, blow for blow, I would expect mirror moves across the board from both of these guys. We are now heading towards that double elixir time. That is where these decks are going to start to come online. The, there's no major differences. We've seen a Fireball and Tornado, so spell, extra spells committed than just the Earthquake on the side of Ivan. I would expect to see something similar coming out um, from our boy Bale as well. And that is the Elixir Golem Getting dropped. For it. Yeah, it is dropped right Getting in the back here, Double Elixir time, about to kick off. Battle Healer being traded out. Here comes the stack. They're all going to force it through on the left-hand side. But that Goblin Hut's going to bring in some extra help. It's going to perpetuate as the Battle Healer will allow these units to collide. No Elixir Golem for the side of Bale just yet. I think he's waiting to get the edge before he commits the beefy boy to the fight. But a second one being deployed by Ivan on the left-hand side. The Brute Force this one through. Uh, yeah, he's got a, a Battle Healer still active as well. I, I don't really think there's a good response. Tornado will do a little bit here, but I genuinely feel like this could just be the push that Ivan needed. Maybe a little bit of a misplay when it comes to how Bale decided to play this matchup. He's going to get... Oh, it's the old one and done. Yeah, he's going to get it. I, I don't think that you can get a good response here from Bale. I think this might just be Ivan's. Another Elixir Golem comes down. You can see Bale has basically just given up. He made a misplay. 
It happens. You hate to see it, Kiernan, but there you go. He's going to let him get the free crown as well, being a good sport about it. So, Ivan, we'll go ahead and take that game as we move on to our next one. Yeah, that was just a, a, a bit unfortunate um, when it came to to how he played the the elixir overtime. He 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 went battle healer, and because he put the battle healer down first, he didn't feel comfortable committing. I, I guess he didn't feel comfortable or didn't have the elixir golem in cycle to throw it down, which seems a bit odd. But he just misplayed that ending there, and Ivan just played the classic, you know, double elixir, throw your elixir golem at the back, and stack everything behind it. Well, there's a Hog Rider coming out nice and strong. Immediately met by the Bomb Tower from Ivan. The Earthquake obviously making an appearance. One swing will be enough. Won't find the second. No, but he is obviously playing some kind of um, uh, Hog Rider cycle. Uh, we saw it from him previously. He does favor these cycle decks more so than Ivan going towards the more uh, beat downy orientated uh, Lava Loons and, and you know, the classic Elixir Golem. Uh, this is where I think... Bale will find the edge in this matchup when he plays these more aggressive decks into, into Ivan. He seems to play them slightly better. We have seen this deck from him as well before. It is the Skeleton uh, Giant as the frontliner, just using that to try and get close to the tower, distract and draw damage, and you throw down things like that Hog Rider behind it and just look to get chip damage over the course of the game. There's the Hog Rider. Not going to be distracted by the Valkyrie. He is, however, going to fall into the trap of going to the Bomb Tower. The Earthquake will help him with that. A bomb might actually clear out the Valkyrie. She's going to walk straight over the top of it. The HP advantage in favor of Bale. Slowly but surely pulling away with a lead here. So he's already got 800 or so damage on that right-hand side tower. There is the, the Lava Hound. We expected this. This is probably just a Lava Loon deck coming out from Ivan. He did find success with it in that first game. I'm expecting his final card to be the Balloon which he will probably throw behind this uh, Lava Hound as it crosses the threshold of the river. You're going to see Rat Hog. going to do it. I was going to say, don't think he's going to do it this time. He's yeah. committed a little bit too late. Has to respond to that Hog Rider on the left. I think Bale was counting on that as well to try and get that Hog Rider through. But now he has to deal with the response. A Miner being committed. So no Balloon this time around for Ivan. He's going to instead have that Miner as his final card. He has unfortunately activated the King Tower now, X. So he's going to struggle to fight against this oppressive defense. Yeah, there was a Firecracker um, just thrown in the back line there that which can deal with Lava Hound and its offspring very nicely. So it was just a, a, a minor to deal with the firecracker. Oh, the Finny Pecker, you have to stop that one, and he lets it through. Oh, no. Ivan, what are you doing? What? The Mini Pecker comes in with the chop. He had so much elixir to work with, he could have blocked it with a multitude of things, although he is running very few ground units, apart from minor Valkyrie and, and Barbarian Barrel. He, he's not running too many ground units. Maybe he just didn't have those in cycle. You can see now he's going for the all-in on the right-hand side, but look at this from Bale. Make the Skeleton Giant is going to make it work. Yeah, he's going to get that tower on the right-hand side, but Bale's happy to give that up, knowing he's gone to a 2-1 victory with 20 seconds remaining and zero damage on Bale's left princess tower. It's going to really struggle. The free crown's coming into effect. Bale goes to 2-1 in this series. Yeah, he just he, he plays the bait so nicely. He, he, he brings out those heavy units on one side, then commits with a lot of offensive capability on the other. We've seen it from him time and time again. Impressive stuff from Bale. Mm -hmm. So we're getting ready to jump into game number four. Bale at match point. One more game will give him a spot in our finals and guarantee him a second place finish. Game number four coming on your screens in just a few more seconds. All right, we are into game four. Ivan versus Bale. This has been a very close and tense affair so far. Both players incredibly good. Skeleton Barrel to kick things off. Immediately responded by Baby Dragon. It's a good response to Skeleton Barrel in general. Actually, Snowball committed too. Doesn't want to drop any health for something as fragile as that. And the Snowball will clear him out. And also cycle through the cards. But here comes the Goblin Barrel. So this is a double barrel deck. Coming in for Ivan just to perpetuate it all on that left-hand side. Yeah, it feels like it's going to be some high cycle uh, coming out from Ivan here. He's going to use the Knight. Knight is such a good uh, beefy tank unit. It, he doesn't really do much in terms of offensive work, but he will soak damage on your side of the field, allowing your Princess Towers or King Towers uh, to get the majority of the damage down. Um, yeah, this just feels like it's going to be constant chip and constant cycle with these barrel spams onto a single Princess Tower throughout this game. There's a lot of answers in Bale's deck to try and shut this down as well. Cannon Cart has to press on forward. That'll get logged out straight away and a bit of a waste of a cannon, but it will still serve some defensive value for him. Yeah, I think this is like a, a kind of like a double barrel log bait deck. 
that we're seeing come out from uh, from Ivan here. So again, he's trying to force his opponent to commit many resources, many defensive things down one side. He'll then log them uh, and use whatever else he has to clean it up. And then he'll go on the offensive with his goblin barrel. Uh, the princess archer coming out as well. That does tell me that it is probably some kind of adjusted log bait deck with the double barrel. And uh, we are going to see the barrels again start to spam down that left hand side. Bandit can't stop that. Well, it's going to stop the knight instead, who immediately takes the shot for the president, for the princess, going to keep her alive. <laughs> oh. And going to be able to dodge through that one. Battle healer doing a good job sustaining them through, trying to get them across the bridge, because Ivan's tower's a bit untouched so far. And this chip is only going to get worse for Bale. It's just over time it goes in. Bat and the skeleton barrel. This is going to be a big hit. Throwing the goblin on top of it as well with 60 seconds left. I think Bale's just conceded this one. He knows oh. there's no way to win. The writing's on the wall. 161 HP remaining. This is a disastrous position for Bale to be in. He completely mistimed that fireball as well. Maybe he was hoping to catch the skeletons in it also. And he didn't. And they managed to get a huge amount of damage onto that left-hand side tower. Now the Princess Archer needs a response on the right-hand side. It will start to chip away, and that is not the optimum placement for the, can the cannon cart, because now you can here's see... the Goblin Barrel. Yeah, it's over. Over the top. Yeah, tower's being taken. 30 seconds remaining. There is still a window of hope for Bale, but his deck is not one that has that punchy burst damage. It's going to need a lot of time to break through. He's going to have to pay perfectly if he stands a chance, but with 15 seconds remaining, I just don't see it happening. He has a limited... He only has limited response to things like the Skeleton Barrel and the Goblin Barrel when they're thrown, and and if they are just thrown at different times, like we saw over the course of this game, you know, if you commit the snowball, you commit the fireball too early, then you have nothing left in the tank to deal with that spam of barrel-based units. Match is over. Ivan levels the series really wonderfully played. Mm -hmm. So we're going over to a game five with this one, making it go the distance as we will have game of find very quickly for you a lot of variation with the decks i'm loving to i'm loving the double barrel log bait deck coming out from ivan just zero response there from bale completely outclassed at deck selection yeah well we are i think this is the final game of this semi-final i think it's a best of five correct me if i'm wrong trid so this game will decide who makes it through yeah would be the case so let's jump into it Golden Hut being deployed and the hog is immediately coming out on the right hand side but the tornado pops the king nice and early that means Ivan's going to have a defensive edge in this battle. Yeah, well, we can see already with Tornado and Goblin Hut, I can make a pretty confident assumption this is likely going to be some kind of Elixir Golem beat down once more. But it looks like it's going to be a more aggressive Hog-based cycle deck with the Musketeer and Hog coming out. That might be just more classic Hog coming out from uh, Bale here. So he's going to be able to maintain pressure. Um, and if he can t continue to do this before Double Elixir comes through, he might find an edge versus his opposition. Uh, at this point in time, with Ivan's deck, that could... I think there's lots of potential for that to have the graveyard into it, but now the battle heal has been shown, completely agree with this, the assessment. We're maybe looking at Elixir Golem to come into this fight as well. Yeah, I think Elixir Golem is going to be the play here. Now it is up to Bale to continue to put pressure on in the next minute, because eventually the Hog deck is going to get outclassed, so you have to look for an opportunity to bait your opponent down one side and commit resources to the other to find a victory. You're going to be looking to mount pressure and continue to cycle through that Hog, get that chip damage, and honestly right now he hasn't got enough damage. Um early enough, I think, versus this, his opposition. He needs to find a big opening sometime soon. Well, the Electric Dragon's going to be deployed coming down the right-hand side. Hog Rider on the left. Tornado yet again pulls him away and draws the aggro of three towers. He's going to get one swing and he's lucky to find that under the circumstances. But his E-Dragon now going to be drawn to the attention of the Knight, as is the Barbarian on the right-hand side. Yeah, but it was a good a good night. It takes a two-for-one trade with the Princess Tower. Um, and already you see the Spear Goblin Tower come through again. That's a nice earthquake combined with the Goblins. They should clear that up easily enough. And actually, you know, a nice, nice elixir lead, or at least generated right there. Two times elixir comes through. This is where you're going to have to start to be worried. What you've got to do is make it difficult for uh, Ivan to commit a heavy unit like Elixir Golem to the back line uh, and try and keep him on, the, on the, the defense. Force him to use his elixir to find responses rather than set up. The, the fireball coming through is perfect for that for instance uh, i think this is obviously a good place for for bale right now he's still forcing his opponent to utilize resources to defend rather than mountain offensive i think this might be one of the games that goes into overtime i'm not seeing that unit being deployed by Ivan just yet so it might come down to the chip damage and the total hp barbarian will find a connection so that helps ivan get further ahead in that regard he is not in possession of the lowest health tower right now but 
Couple more logs on his right hand side will change that as well as the snowball. Musketeer walking across will get dealt with by this three man goon squad coming on the right hand side. The Hog Rider will get the connection. One swing, two swing, drops it down to 1200. The towers are in disarray, but this right hand push has not been dealt with. And there's the Elixir Golem at the bomb tower with the units. It's been dealt with quite well by Bale, but it will still find a brief connection. Yeah, he does have the Knight here baiting out versus the Battle Healer. The Musketeer should come in nicely. This was actually a really good defense versus an Elixir Golem all in. Earthquake is there. That's a big play for the Hog rider on the left hand side because he's chipped it down to 760 that's a good defense from Abel. he's put himself in a solid position now he can see the big play with the elixir golem on the left hand side that i'll teach you about or tell him how much elixir is being committed to that left hand side and the hog rider will go down on the right yeah abusing the fact that he should have some kind of elixir advantage right now bomb tower will draw the aggro of the golem on the left hand side a lot of units being stacked up here for ivan as well as the battle healer Snowball's going to try and deal with that as Musketeer goes point blank range, turning that into a blunderbuss instead to shred through the rest of Ivan's unit, but has not found the ideal connection. His little Golemites will go ahead and deal whatever damage they can, but it's nothing substantial with one minute left of overtime. But here comes the second wave of this assault. Hog on the right, Hog on the right. Oh... Really lovely play from Bale there. Wow. Excoundrel, you were singing Bale's praises going into that semi final. Are you happy to sing them now? Yeah, I mean, I look, I think both players played very well, but I, I just feel like the the aggressive decks were rewarded here. I feel like Ivan defaulted to some more heavy, uh, uh, you know, two times elixir beatdown decks. And when you're playing against something like a Hog Cycle, who just constantly finds low elixir uh, aggressive maneuvers, uh, what he, he the way that the, the Bale played that last match, you know, he was just constantly forcing um, elixir to be spent on defensive uh, de defensive maneuvers, never allowing the beatdown deck to essentially build up to ten elixir and start their big push. So he played it really well. I'm glad to see him make it through because I think he's a great player. Well, let's check in with Woody to find out what he thought. Sounds good, Frankie. Ivan took the initiative in game one with a minor poison deck that also earned a surprising chunk of damage from his skeleton barrel. He repeatedly fended off mid-sized pushes from Bale by using high DPS guards like Bats and Dart Goblin, and thus held a slim damage lead going into sudden death. However, a late log roll onto a cannon cart left his tower vulnerable to a massive 880 damage that brought victory for Bale. I got double vision in game two, watching a mirror match that was shattered by Ivan's first push in double elixir time. It started out as tit for tat, but Bali rolled the welcome mat to invite death from above by four dragons. Ivan's perfect pounce went straight for the jugular and earned him a quick triple crown finish. But turnabout's fair play, as we saw in the very next game. Bali took first blood with a hog rider hit and earthquake spell to shake up his opponent's defenses. Ivan had an elixir lead and knew Bale's hog was out of cycle, so he dropped a lava hound to build an early push. He must have been shocked to find a mini peck on his tower soon after, and his miner mistakenly activating the king as well. To divide his foe's forces, Bale played both lanes and with an overwhelming push reclaimed his three crowns. But then he was soon caught, for he committed the grave sin of playing giant snowball against a log bait deck. Ivan threw wave after wave of his own troops at the enemy tower, breaking through with just enough time to leave Bale staggering off balance. When he finally got a chance to attack with his Ram Rider, he found a wall of bomb towers standing in his way. There was no time left for Bale. With the match outcome hanging in the balance, each player brought a deck they had won with before. Pulling the Hog Rider first onto his king, Ivan took a defensive posture that let Bale set the pacing and the lane of play for most of the battle. As Triple Elixir time neared, Ivan committed a doomed push that left him incapable of fending off attacks. In the end, spell damage brought the tower down, not with a bang, but with a whimper. For the next match, let's send it back to Frankie. Thank you very much, Woody. It's now time to find out who Bale is going to be facing in the grand final. And our matchup is going to be between Neki Lick and Kota Wanatabe. Now, Gentlemen, first impressions of these two guys. Arkyo, you're rejoining us. So I'll let you go first. 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been pretty impressed by both, I'm not going to lie. I mean, uh, Custom Watson number 8 uh, has been the only person today to bring out the Expo. Um, and that, for me, I think could go in his favor. Uh, but Nekalink, very on the defensive as well. So I think he does seem to have a lot of answers for a lot of these cards. You know what, Ark? I never got your opinion on the Expo. Uh, obviously, there's Team It Scoundrel, which is like, yes, the Expo. And then there's Trid, who's just like, no, it's it's a garbage card. So, <laughs> so what's your opinion? I'm a bit on both sides. I think if it's in the game, it's fair game. And I think that that's part of the, the fun of this is like that you have to be aware of these cards that, you know, could pose a problem. And uh, there's a lot of skill involved in that response. And uh, for me, yeah, if it's in the game, it's fair game. What about you, Ark? Who are you predicting to make it into the grand final? I think it's going to be a close one, not going to lie. Uh, if, I, if I had to put my Red Bull on one side, i will probably go for Nekalink. <laughs> okay, well, let's find out if you gentlemen are right as we head into our second semi-final. All right, here we go. It is Nekilik taking on Kota Watanabe. It's going to be a very tense series. Again, spot in the final and guaranteed money on the line for these two players if you get through. Obviously, if you do lose, you have to then go into another series to even get that money. You know, it's 5,000 for the third place. But if you win this, you are guaranteed something at the end of the day. And already, you can see Ice Wizard and Electro Tower out for Kota Watanabe. So we're again looking at one of his more aggressive... I, I guess this is a graveyard deck coming up from him. Yeah, possibly so. And if that's the case, I, I do like the, the love hand. Here we go. We see the expo oh, no. coming out. It's, it's expo. <laughs> yeah, that expo from uh, Kota Watanabe that we've seen already today making a second appearance. Uh, I wonder whether, though, it might have served to have been saved for a, uh, a later game, perhaps. Um, but, uh, you know, because then it takes it more by surprise. But uh, already we can see that it has locked on to Nekilix Tower and getting considerable damage. Uh, a solid uh, 600 HP there, taking down in the early stages of this game so far. Yeah, but he doesn't have much elixir to deal with this very healthy Lava Hound and the Inferno Dragon on the back line. There comes the poison as well. This might just be a devastating push from Lecky Lick. Yeah, desperate tornado there to pull the Inferno Tower, uh, to pull the Inferno Dragon away from the tower, but it does connect and that is a, a very, very solid response to the, uh, the Lava Hound still going. Yeah, he will indeed. That's a good amount of damage with the Lava Deck this early on though. Uh, he's not playing the Balloon variant, he's playing the Minor Inferno Dragon variant, so instead trying to combo those two units together using the Lava Hound to soak damage and allowing the Inferno Dragon to go to town, but this is looking pretty good actually for Nekilik so far. You know, going up against a more aggressive Expo variant, he's managed to come out in the lead in terms of chip damage. Yeah, I'm still very impressed by Nekilik's uh, awareness to uh, to Elixir and to, to not uh, under or over commit in that respect. And uh, down goes another Lava Hound and uh, definitely a good timing of that as the uh, the Expo goes down into Double Elixir. We are into Double Elixir now, the Expo will land, but the Poison will start to do some real damage here. The thing about Barbarians as well is that they will soak damage from that Expo unnecessarily for, for Kota Watanabe, and he will not want that to be the case. As you can see, that Expo did not get the damage it needed to. Three Dragons on the push here, or rather, I guess, Hound. The Rocket comes through. Expensive spell, but it gets a lot of value as well. Still, chip damage starting to come through for, uh, for Neki Lick already, taking it down to 800 HP. So much value from that rocket. Uh, definitely a solid spell card to have, uh, to have used there. But um, still, though, Kota Watanami is down on the tower and it's going to have to do something uh, and something soon. It, it, otherwise, this game is going to go the way of Nekilik pretty thick and fast. Yeah, because he's got Miner, he's got Poison. He can throw that down time and time again on that left-hand side Princess Tower. Here comes the more aggressive crossbow play. Inferno Dragon is down, and it has a locked on to the crossbow. That is not a good look for Kota Watanabe. Tornado will only do so much in this scenario as the Poison and Miner is there once again. Now, the, the race is on. It really feels like he's trying to do his best to get that crossbow down. The yeah. uh, Zap will reset. That's really nice. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the Expo locking onto the tower there, but the Miner and the Poison did a lot of damage in the meantime, and surely now Nekalik is looking to circle back to that Poison to get it on the tower. The Miner connects, and I think with one more hit, it is going to do just that. Nekalik will take the first game. 
Yeah, I think he just got too much early chip damage for the crossbow to deal with. Plus, he was running so many cards that distract that crossbow, like the Barbarians. They're tanky. They take a long time to get through, never allowing that expo to ramp up. So that was just, I think, an unfortunate matchup for Kota Watanabe there. Couldn't actually make it work for him. And we're going to head into our second game here as Nekilik throws out the good luck. He is 1-0 up in this series. And we are going to see the first card played early on then, which, uh, oh, we're going to see the, the Expo making a second appearance as well for Kota Watanabe. And it's going to lock on and get uh, some quick early value, taking down that, uh, that uh, the uh, Goblin Hut there. And um, that is going to bring out the Lava Hound as well. Some, some big cards uh, straight off the bat then. Yeah, similar deck archetypes run in this second game here, as you can see. Wonder which. If, wonder if it's a similar variant of the Lava Hound deck that we're seeing from from Mechie Lick this time around, or whether it is going to be the Balloon variant that is the more classic Lava Hound. The poison comes through, so maybe we'll see the Miner once more. And again, Crossbow will go down. Tesla Tower will also get dropped. And again, I think there might just be an identical deck being run. Yeah, yeah Miner comes looks through. That way. Yeah, I, I think this is just going to be. Another, I think this, if, if these are two identical, it, it looks like it's going to be two identical decks run once more. This might just be another unfortunate matchup for Okota Watanabe. Well, absolutely. I mean, Nekalik had uh, had all the right answers in response in the previous game. So if that is the case, and it does seem to be, having said that, the Expo has locked on, getting considerable damage and definitely going to put uh, Kotowata number into a good position. It's continuing to get some serious damage. And I feel like Nekalik has to shut this down fast or this is going to be over before it's even started. Yeah, he does get it down, but that is 2,000 or so damage already thrown onto the right-hand side Princess Tower of Nekilek. And that is not what you want, because you 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 let your defense slip for a second, and Kota Watanabe gets a good offensive crossbow placed. That's your tower down, and that's it. You can't you can't respond, and it's very difficult when you're playing a Lava Hound deck to, met to mount a quick response. Lava Hound decks are slow. Build from the back, work with that. You do not have the likes of a Hog Rider to just storm down one-hand side and start, you know, wailing away on the other Princess Tower. It is more of a slow build up with these kind of decks and whereas crossbow throw it down it can start to ramp up immediately yeah absolutely and uh the look at this push here coming in and warrants uh, a rocket on the defense by kota watanambe and uh the miner as well getting good uh good damage on the uh ice wizard and it's going to connect with the tower along with the uh the pups getting a, a nice attack in by nekilik there and uh, just closing the gap but it's still going to be kota watanambe with a decent lead and again, that expo is connecting the damage rolling in and surely there's going to be a tower down at a crucial moment in this game. Yeah, that's a really nicely played crossbow and it does get that first tower. Now the pressure is on for Nekilik to respond and find a tower of his own in the next 19 seconds. It's going to be very difficult, but the, the lava pups are going for it. The tornado is good, but is it going to be good enough as the baby dragon starts to wail away? Here comes the barbarians. It's desperation defense right now from Kota Watanabe, but with seven seconds left to go, you can't help but feel he has done it and he's managed to secure a victory for himself. Oh, it was a good final push, but it was just too little, too late. And we're going to be drawn up now one, uh, one game each. And uh, now it's, it's all back to play for it. It was a, a good comeback there uh, by Kato Watanabe. Absolutely. Uh, impressive stuff from him. And he does indeed level the series. Uh, again, we expected it to be close. That was uh, just a really nicely timed expo to get himself that victory. Let's see which deck archetypes come through once more. And uh, it's going to be a minor immediate, an immediate minor coming out from Neki Lick right now with the Valkyrie and the Bats coming through from Kota Watanabe. Any indication about what decks you might be seeing based on these cards? Well, I think it might be fair to say that we're going to be losing the Expo this time around, and I think that would be wise. Uh, we are going to see probably like a, a Hog Cycle deck, I imagine, here, uh, as the, it's probably going to get some decent damage as well. The Musks here, the only card uh, Nekilik is, is going to place down to defend that push, but uh, uh, a Ooh. giant beatdown perhaps there we're going to see. Yeah, I haven't seen one of those yet, have we? Classic giant beatdown. It's been a while. Um, this is a very, very old school deck being run here by uh, by Neki Lick. You don't see as much of that these days. Sometimes giant double prints, you know, if you're if you're in that kind of vibe of the meta. But yeah, it's cool to see some classic giant coming through from Neki Lick. Yeah, classic cards all around. Uh, I mean, the minor being the most recent of which I've always been pretty much running a rare retro royale deck here uh, by Neki Lick. And um, yeah, I mean, early on though, you know, the the, the damage was dealt definitely by Kata Watanabe, and uh, kind of curious to see what else he's hiding in his deck. 
does look like a, a more sort of classic hog. I mean, it's not even really classic hog. It, it, it's it's got some good defensive utility with the bomb tower there as well, but it is some kind of hog cycle deck. Mini Pekka, a good response to hog, gets rid of it very quickly. You do have to be careful about Mini Pekka, it will deal a significant amount of damage. But stuff like goblins buys you enough time to allow the princess tower to do its work, and that is a uh, a good little defensive play there from Kota Wadnabi. Nothing more than expected for a player of his caliber. Yep. Giant in the back then, and um, I feel like uh, Neki will be holding on to that uh, mini pecker as a good response. Like you say to that uh, that hog dog prince, gonna be is it double prince? Is it is it giant yeah. double prince? <laughs> what year that, is this? That's not a deck. I'm not. Yeah, exactly. It's, and it's not double prince. It's just. I don't know. We haven't seen the final card yet. I mean, no. I haven't seen giant double prince in such a long time. Um, but if it, it, you know, the, the, the inclusion of a single prince there, you know, it's a very classic deck coming out from uh, from from uh, Neki Lick so far. Yeah, the, uh, the mini picker for the response does get the hog run taken down in just uh, the one hit just in. Uh, but the chip damage, you've got to say, is going in by Kotawata Nambe. Uh, Nekilik needs to, uh, to sort of build up his collector, uh, his, his elixir rather, and start to get a, a pretty substantial push. Or I, I kind of feel like uh, uh, Kotawata Nambe is going to continue chipping away here. Yeah, we, we still have one card held by either player. So wondering whether that's like a utility card or a card that's integral to the sort of the end game of these two particular decks. But uh, Baby Dragon's going to go out to get some value. Poison comes out here from uh, Neki Lick, just looking to get a huge value, holding that on to the very end, waiting for his opponent to commit a huge amount of resources. And he's finally going to start to get... Oh, the, the Mini Pekka's going to town! The Mini Pekka going to town. Baby Dragon will get the Princess Tower. And that was a sneaky little play by Neki Lick to secure his second game. Wow, who would have thought that the, the mini pecker was just used so much on defense, finally made its way to connect and uh, turn that game around, now giving Neki Lick the lead then, and uh, Kota Watanabe, uh, who looked so solid in that last game, now uh, looking a little bit shaky going into what could be the final game of this series. Yeah, we'll have to keep our eyes peeled. Let's see where Kota Watanabe... Uh defaults back to. The Miner immediately popped once more here by Nekilik. So, running... Oh, Flying Machine. Okay, we're changing it up. Flying Machine deck coming out from Nekilik this time around. He did use this in the quarterfinals, I believe. Yeah, I think he did, and uh, definitely switching things up again then. Um, Kotobotanambe going with the Goblin Hut, and I'm just trying to work out what kind of deck he might be holding on to this time round, but uh, Nekilik not going to hold back on the poison and, and getting in some early tick damage. Oh, we're going to see some Graveyard then. It's Graveyard. Yeah, Graveyard coming through. Uh, Snowball is going to be trying to buy as much time with that Graveyard as possible, but the, you know, the, the Barbarians and Baby Dragon, they're a good response to Graveyard. You won't get too much damage down with that spell just yet. Yeah, I kind of feel like he might have been uh, better off served holding back on that and uh, trying to choose the timing more wisely there to try to take uh, Nikolik by surprise, but a pretty comfortable defense as far as that goes. And uh, the Graveyard's just such a good card to play at a time of, of desperation. I feel like it was uh, maybe not the best timing there. No, absolutely not. I could have held on to it maybe for a bit longer. Poison comes down just to chip away at that Spear Goblin Hut and make those Spear Goblins uh, more vu vulnerable as they exit the building. That's a, a good, nice response. And again, it's one of the benefits of a spell like that. You can get a double whammy damage onto the Princess Tower as well. And it just looks like these Spear Goblin Huts are going to expire at similar times. Knight comes down on the right-hand side with the graveyard again, but the, the elixir is there for a very easy response from Nicky Lick. Yeah, I'm kind of surprised that uh, Kota Watanabe hasn't brought in a poison spell, at least not that we've seen yet alongside this uh, this Graveyard Spurs. It would be uh, so much value to take down those uh, those barbarians in the process. And uh, he does, you know, Nekilik does seem to be in control of this game as uh, he plays his final card then, the Lava Hound going down. And uh, what do you think is going to support this left-hand side push here? I feel like it's just going to be a minor poison push or the flying machine going to drop behind it. Baby dragon as well, a good response. That is going to be a lot of elixir committed though and immediately going to force a response with this graveyard on the right-hand side. The flying machine with the combination of the princess tower should be enough to defend and it looks like it's going to be a commit to the left-hand side push from Neki Lick as the lava hound splits but the flying machine is working. 
Yeah, it was a great uh, diversion. Then placing down the graveyard just to kind of like uh, to, to, to deflate some of that Alexa by Neki Lake, who's forced to play the poison as a response. It was a pretty solid defense, but it did uh, enable to be less of a push. But now look at this 600 HP left on that left hand side tower. The Lava Hound coming in, the Baby Dragon now, the, uh, the machine as well. This is a pretty strong, solid push on this left hand side. Yeah, and I don't think Graveyard's going to be able to use offensively here. He's having to allocate those resources into a defensive manoeuvre. The poison is coming through. Obviously, Lava Hound is going in on that tower. This should be enough. Maybe with the Lava Pups popping out the end. And this time, Snowball. Well, not this time, but it just doesn't do enough work. And 4 HP. Just you've got, He's going to cycle. Surely, he's just going to cycle to get to a poison and win this game. Zap would even do his job, and it does. Zap gets the victory for Neki Lick, and he takes this semi-final 3-1. Well, Neki Lake jumped on his flying machine and has flown all the way to the grand finals. We'll be seeing him back here shortly playing against Bale. And that's not the last time we've seen Koto Watanabe either because he's going to be playing in the bronze medal match against Ivan. I'm kind of interested in hearing from Excoundrel right now because there was a bit of excitement at seeing that old school giant deck. Tell me why you were happy to see it, Excoundrel. I mean, that deck, barring maybe Dark Prince and Minor, I mean, you, you replace Dark Prince with Classic Prince and Minor with pretty much anything else, and you have, like, a super classic, like, the deck that you, you build when you first play Clash Royale, you know, like, you put Minor in, you put Giant in the front, you put your, your big DPS behind him. It's just, like, a really simple, classic Clash Royale deck, and, and sometimes it's nice, you know, nice to go back to the very basics, and, and, and Nekilik, I think what I like about Nekilik is he's showing a great breadth of, of decks used, like, he's bringing out stuff that we aren't seeing from other players flying machine giant decks um it's just it's just a cool set of 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 units that we haven't seen many other players use or exploit should simple though be able to trump everything else arc um you know, it's it's one of those things where simple often is better. Um, you know, being you know, overthinking your deck can often lead to a, a bad situation. You know, going back to basics and just keeping things uh, familiar. I mean, you know, that that was like the bread and butter of Clash Royale when the game first came out. And I remember that classic uh, giant push um, myself. It brings back some great memories. And um, yeah, I would say that often you know, keeping things simple and and concise uh, can often play to your advantage. Well, we're going to keep things classic, we're going to keep things old school, and we're going to kick it over to our analyst, Woody. You have my thanks, Frankie. Hajime returned with his Expo deck in the first game, but was no match for a Lava Miner beatdown from Nekilik. His Tesla defenses failing to repel double dragons, Hajime was in dire straits at the start of overtime, but nearly caught fire with an Expo lock that almost brought the enemy tower into rocket range. Switching to old reliable, Neki Lick's persistent minor poison strikes found their mark and finished the fight. But since they had so much fun, each player decided to rematch with the same deck. That saw a reversal of fortunes for Hajime, who scored an early expo lock when Neki Lick failed to drop his Goblin Hut in time to block. That split second error surely cost him the game, as Hajime had no trouble stalling out the remaining time, tossing rockets to rain down fury on the Inferno Dragons that had vexed him last game. An old school duel followed next, with Hajime's hog cycle facing down Nekilik's giant beatdown. When he noticed his opponent's mini P.E.K.K.A straying into the opposite lane, Hajime launched an early hog strike that got three hits and formed the upper hand. But all good things must come to an end as Nekilik adjusted his rotation to fend off hogs and deftly snuck a ninja P.E.K.K.A straight onto the tower for a quick kill in early overtime. The last game of our match saw Nekilik take the pilot seat with a Lava Miner deck with all the right responses to Hajime's graveyard cycle. The crucial exchange came just after the start of Double Elixir time when Hajime played a Knight Graveyard opposite an oncoming Lava Hound to try to split Neki's response. Instead, he shut it down with a Poison and Flying Machine that swapped back to boost the damage of his Knockout Punch. My time has come to an end, so for now, more from Frankie. Thank you very much, Woody. Now I'm joined by Excoundrel and Trader as we discuss our bronze medal match because either Ivan or Kota Watanabe will be taking home 5,000 euros and our bronze medal. Well, let's head into this third place match then, gentlemen. 
Thank you very much, Frankie. 5,000 euros on the line. Fourth place walks away with nothing but the rule makers, the money pushers, the beam pushers, if you will, want to make sure that it's all or nothing for these gentlemen. So in the third place match, one goes home empty handed and it's going to be 3-1 games that decides who does that. It game. will indeed. Let's see. Uh, no. Okay. Goblin Hut comes down early on here for Kota Watanabe. <laughs> Lava Hound there for Ivan. We've seen a lot of Lava Hound decks, not, not necessarily Lava Loon. In fact, I think we've seen less Lava Loon and more kind of like Lava Minor Poison combos coming out. Um, but again, no. Yeah, just... So I was going to say, so there's something beefy to draw the attention and let that miner and the poison sneak in there. So a lot of threat being put on the left-hand side with the Lava Hound and the Flying Machine. Only chipping away at it right now. Nothing substantial. And the connection from the Lava Hound is there for Ivan already. Very low damage dealer, but still worth to note as the pups have now spawned and will scatter everywhere. As Battle Healer, just oblivious to the damage coming in, cannot retaliate to these Sky no, uh, The Flying Machine getting some good value out here, and I love that the Zap to, to, to reset the attack pattern and he's going to start to get some chips in with this flying machine well played by ivan um, i think we can very make a, a very quick assertion that uh kota watanabe has changed up his style and is playing a elixir beat down deck so elixir golem beat down with the battle healer inclusion there a very classic setup for him with the electro dragon and barbarian barrel um and for the other side this is ivan running something similar that we saw neki run in the previous engage where it was a a lava hound backed up by the likes of baby dragon and flying machine Okay, good response on the right-hand side, dropping that Elixir Golem on the time that the Lava Hound was produced, so you know you're at similar Elixir levels, and you can commit to this push. If you don't defend the Lava Hound and this goes wrong, however, you're going to fall into a lot of problems. The Goblin Hut, it isn't fresh. It will go down with one hit here, as the Tornado will enter everyone into the center to get loads of damage onto them from the way. Barbarian seems to be a good answer here on the right-hand side. The connection that was found by that Elixir Golem absolutely dismantled Bye. Yeah, the problem with Elixir Golem is, as you see here, you, you get a huge Elixir advantage. If you don't get any major work done with it, you're giving your opponent a lot of resources to work with to mount a comeback. Um, that is why it's better in double Elixir, and it's better in Elixir Overtime, because you can you can mitigate that by getting a huge amount of resources back very quickly as well. So, um, you know, committing an Elixir Golem this early on is, is quite risky, because you, you give your opponent, especially someone who's running quite a heavy deck with the, with the Lava Hound, so many resources to mount a good attack with. So that's why I find it is sometimes a little bit um, uh, awkward if you know committing a uh, elixir golem that early because it, 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 you don't have the the natural double elixir to make up for the the, the sort of the elixir that you're giving over to your opponent. Yeah, and consistently this battle heal is giving zero value for uh, Kota just because there's no targets for it to attack, no targets for it to heal, it's not in combat. And now you've got the fire machine connecting these units. It's going to make a connection onto the left-hand side. The pups are in position. This tower is surely going down with a couple of seconds remaining. The poison will tick over as well as the flying machine. Ivan takes game yeah, number one. I feel like that was a mistake from Kota Watanabe. You, you give like a huge amount of elixir over to your opponent by committing the elixir goal on pre-double elixir um and, and because the elixir is only generating at normal speed at that point um you can't make up that elixir disadvantage as quickly and therefore the lava hound he basically got he basically got a free lava hound from that push and that allowed him to at the end you saw there get a double lava hound out which allowed him to get a really really good push onto that left hand side pr uh, princess tower yeah, an insurmountable push that just couldn't be answered by a representative from Japan. Game number two coming on your screens. It's Ivan who holds the lead. And he needs two more game wins to walk away with the series. And to open things up, we've got a nice split at the back for Kota with the archers. The firecracker will deal with yeah, them. We haven't seen much. Oh, he I, I just fireballs it. Fireballs it in the face. Uh, Log comes through, deals with one of the archers, gets a bit of hit. Uh, oh, okay. Is this like either a classic, like a super classic hog cycle or maybe even a mortar deck coming out or it's just a, it's expo right or it's just classic expo from kota watanabe I, I i'm imagining i'm imagining expo actually with the skeletons there's a few avenues he can go down with this one i think but i think it's more likely if it's kota it will be this expo deck so he needs to find the right opportunity to deploy that for the first time Drawing a lot of tension for the huntsman then for the ice golem instead mini peck is going to meet that ice golem and chop him down real quick Tesla being deployed as well, so I do have a distinct feeling it will be this expo to be the yep. last card. I think that's very likely. He's going to log the Pekka, which is going to allow him to have that Tesla be dealt with nicely. Tesla will get good value getting out the mini Pekka and the Firecracker. 
And like you said, he's just waiting for the opportune time to commit the expo. Seen every At the same time, Ivan's not been able to deal that damage to the turrets either, so it's been very slow for both teams so far. Expo on the field. The Royal Hogs are going to go straight for it, and the Earthquake is there. Great responses from Ivan to shut that down immediately, and no connection found for Kota against any Yeah, meaningful this is the structure. Hog cycle deck, or rather the uh, the Royal Hog cycle deck that we saw from Ivan early on with the Heal Spirit as well. Um, a card that we've only seen used in a limited amount during this tournament, but actually can be a very powerful card when combined with the likes of the Royal Hogs. So, Royal Hogs can be a nuisance for Expo decks. It is a building at the end of the day. He's going to use a log to randomly cycle and get a bit of damage down on that left-hand side Princess Tower. Definitely feel like this game is going to come down to uh, a single mistake made. He's going to split the Hogs. Tesla will bring them to the center, and there is going to be the Earthquake committed. And that's the time. That's the time that you go for the Expo right now. Yeah, absolutely commit the elixir. The ice golem is going to be a great bait for that buy more time to find an option to switch the aggro to. The hunter is there to cut through a lot of these units, as is the mini pecker to cut through. Hasn't got the HP, but one chop and an earthquake should deal the trick. The log is going to be more impactful than that expo ever could be. Another great shutdown yeah, by Yeah, but I he lost a lot of resources to that expo, so it, I think it was an even trade at the end of the day. Oh, he's going to go expo on one side. That's a really nice fireball, but the uh, again, the ice golem will draw a lot of attention here, backed up by the mini pecker. The heal? That is the heal coming through. As you said, the heal spirit is so impactful in these situations, and it's done a lot of work, but again, it's been a commit. Earthquake will be the bane of this expo deck, but they, I think they've gone pretty even in terms of trading on the left and right-hand side. Yeah, it seems that on the right-hand side, uh, Coates is more even to those triple digits. Again, the exact same sequence of cards being rolled. The Royal Hogs, this time cut down by the Skeletons to stop that damage coming in. Ice Golem did a lot of work to stop that Expo from connecting, and Pekka and Earthquake should do the rest of it. But still, minuscule chip coming through, so not a complete loss, but it is only Kota who is sitting in triple yeah, digits Yeah, it is. Right uh, Kota right now is at 961, and again, he's going to essentially see the same thing happen over and over. Going to try and bait out... Okay, I was going to say, Tesla's a nice switch up here instead of using the Fireball instead. I guess it's just what's on rotation. Ice Golem being committed here as well. It's one of the many Pekka, so he's putting everything into this right-hand side push. If the Expo found a way to get deployed right now, he might have a little bit of difficulty. But there's the Hunter on the left-hand side. Expo looking on to find that damage on the left. The Hunter will take the aggro, and the Earthquake is there. But the Hogs cannot break through these Skeletons, so it is roughly stalemated again. But every time, Ivan inches closer to yeah, victory. Yeah, the Heal Spear actually just used to take that out right at the end is so so close i just think this is a rough matchup right now for koto he can't deal with the hogs every time they come down the tesla again used alongside the fireball there is going to be the earthquake immediately chipping down onto that left hand uh, right hand side princess tower but here is the expo once more it's going to get baited out by the ice golem the hogs come through the log in desperation you feel this could be the push that ivan was looking for yeah, he's going to get that connection. One, two, two. So close to defeat. And Earthquake might be enough to finish this one off if he cycles for it. But he cannot let that Expo connect because it can kill it just as fast. 30 seconds remaining. Earthquake used on the right-hand side. The GG comes out. And Ivan inches one game closer to a third place yeah, finish. Yeah, unfortunate for Koto there because Earthquake is such a good card versus these types of building-orientated decks. And unfortunately, he was just in a bad matchup in that situation. Had very little options to deal with the, the Hogs. And again, Ivan now one game away from getting the third place prize of 5,000 euros. It's a lot of money. A lot of money in comparison to nothing anyway as well, which is exactly what the loser of this match walks away with. Elixir being leaked, kid. And we sent in some heavier decks coming through for this potentially final game. Maybe. We'll have to see. I mean, it's, it's been a while since we've seen that kind of play. I think they're really harking back to the first game of our broadcast where we saw the players go all the way down to double Elixir. I don't think we've seen many other games follow that same pattern throughout today, but it is going to be the mini Pekka committed very early on here by Kota Watanabe. Immediately the battle healer out to deal with that. Battle healer is a great response to something like mini Pekka because it can tank very easily. And it is an even elixir trade at the end of the day too. And with the spear golems, I feel like this is another, this is an elixir golem deck coming out from Ivan. They have of course swapped sides for this particular game. Expecting him to pull that one out so we won't see the true strength of his deck until right at the very end when we get to the double elixir and triple elixir time.
Kota. However, still working out what deck. What's that deck screaming to you, Kieran, on Kota's side? Can you start to work out what that is, or is it all the uh, To be honest, it could be a, a multitude of things right now. He hasn't really shown as much. It could be a Mega Knight deck that. Okay, Dark Prince. Yeah, the Dark as well. Prince does come out. I mean, again, it's difficult to tell. There isn't really a big finishing card here, so um, again, I'm still waiting to see exactly what is going to be committed. I mean, it yeah. could be a Mega Knight deck. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a Sparkies. Oh, it's a Sparkies, Sparkies deck. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's go creep in on the right hand side. I mean, that E Dragon is going to be the absolute bane of existence for Kota. Because he can just sick the E Dragon on that and constantly reset Sparky's attack. It has such a long wind up, the potential is never going to get the hit. So the Goblin Giant is that brooding force that's going to come in on the right hand side. Barrel will distract Sparky's first hit. He's going to have to do it without the use of the Dragon. The Earthquake connecting as well. Sparky's <laughs> charging up. Something oh, has to no. take the hit. Nothing does. He'll get the connection. And Kota. Drops him down to 386 in a monstrous push. Oh, Sparkies, push. you hate to see it, mate. You hate to bloody see it. That is a beautiful, oh, almost, almost good enough to let, allow the Dark Prince to get the connection on the charge. I was really thinking that Snowball was going to be it. Out comes E-Dragon and Elixir Golem. This is an all-in push coming out oh, from Ivan right here no. on the right-hand side. Has Koda got the resources to stop this? He just committed the Earthquake to go for the cycle. It might have been a little bit too much. The Tornado going to pull in lots of members of Kota's defense. The Elixir Golem will go ahead and get that connection, but the beefier units haven't found a way through yet. There's 147 HP on his right side turret. The Battle Healer powering through. This could be the push, kid. And there's the E-Dragon's e also going to connect. The ha Healer hitting everyone in this offense. And the Tornado. Oh, but like Earthquake, Earthquake Trent. They're trying... The Earthquake's going to get it. It's going to turn it around. Wait, one second remaining. And no. Kota's going to be able to stay alive in this oh, series. Oh, wow. That was a clutch Earthquake right at the end there. Beautiful push with the Sparkies. Sometimes you just don't have the cards to deal with it. The, you know, it's really difficult to deal with the Sparkies if you just don't have the right setup. And obviously, he didn't have that E-Dragon in rotation. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. We're going into the fourth game. Koto brings one back. All right, nice to see something alive. I wouldn't want to have seen a sweep this far into the tournament, Kieran. And so, 3-1 scoreline in favor of Ivan, who is now back on the blue side. As Coast is going to head up into the top. The Tesla, it's screaming to me. We may be seeing that Expo yeah, once again. Yeah, he needs to get a win with it, right? So... He is going to be bringing that expo once more to the party, and uh, maybe I'm being proved wrong here because he struggled to make it work in this uh, in this uh, third place match. E Dragon comes out again. Oh, that's so okay. cool. Oh, that's disastrous. The E Dragon's actually nightmare fuel for the expo. It's still going to be able to cut through all the defenses and the bow itself as a ground unit gets in way. Battle Healer will get that first connection and be able to start sustaining through the expo damage. There's a lot of answers in Ivan's deck for that particular unit. Kota's up against the wall of it yeah, in I this feel like match. He's going to have a rough one here. Obviously, Ivan with that uh, Elixir Golem should have the favorable matchup especially running the the electro dragon i'm i'm really not expecting um big things out of koto here he'd have to get he just had to get a huge opening he'd have to have a mismanagement of resources from ivan I, I genuinely think ivan is favored in what could be the final game for him well there's that expo gonna lock on to that first goblin then the goblin hut to take it out at the source and really chip away at the value of that card the earthquakes present yet again i cannot stress enough how many options ivan has to shut down this expo you're gonna need a miracle if you're coated to get through this leaking elixir for the time being but in 23 seconds kid we can expect to see that first big yeah push. he doesn't need to make any moves right now because you've just seen the expo come down you've got to see some cycle coming out of uh You've seen the Tesla exactly. come down you've as well. See, you've got to see some cycle coming down. There's no there's no aggressive play from this deck other than the Expo. Usually you wait and you bait and use the log and defensive capa capabilities to commit a lot of resources of your opponent and then you just Expo afterwards. But there's no need to make the offensive mood, move if you're playing the Elixir Golem. Here comes the Expo. It's got a good knight in front of it. It's going to have to be a response now from Ivan. Battle heal is enough to sustain for the time being. Log Ivan to make the burp but the Earthquake does its job. 
Pushing on the right-hand side. Tesla has now been redeployed. These two units will go down. I think the next push might be the one that Ivan uses to end it all because he's looking pretty healthy right now for Elixir. Expo might for his, for his hand. The Golem going on the left-hand side, but he's got units on the right to cover for the Expo for now, but he needs to manage supporting that push on the left whilst also defending against Cody's aggression. He knows he's got 20 seconds until overtime. He knows that he can work with this push on the Elixir Golem on the left-hand side. He, honestly, he has Earthquake. He knows that he has Earthquake. There's no real worry for him. He has a spell that is perfectly poised to deal with that Expo every single time that it gets dropped onto the field. Elixir Golem's coming through now. He's got another pack push that he can start from the back if he really wants to. Again, just setting up for that perfect beatdown. Okay, we're into overtime right now. There's that Golem on the right-hand side. Expo out of range to hit the Princess Towers. Just on the edge of the Earthquake. So he's still going to get eroded. He cannot escape this damage. But the Goblin Hut will be burnt down. Ice Wizard sneaking his way in there on the left-hand side to get some damage in with the Golem push. Finally assembled correctly for Ivan on the right-hand side as options need to come in here to try and stop this tornado. Fireball, a great response from Kota, but the truck keeps on rolling into his lane. And the cannon. battle healer going in trade. That is what it makes this card so powerful. Just when you think you've done your defensive work, battle healer makes it 10 times harder for you as she brings the entire team back to a reasonable amount of, amount of HP. And still, Electro Wizard and Battle Healer going. Good night bait. Really good night bait from Koto to stop this one short. But Defensive Expos ain't going to cut it at this time, mate. Defensive Expos are not the play. You need to find your way in and look for an aggressive maneuver. It's not even in range to hit that Goblin Hut that's been placed slightly further back. The Fireball trying to chip away, making the difference because it might come down to HP difference in this rate, Kin, and neither can have a solid offense attacking it. Great value Earthquake removing both the buildings as the Golem's coming in. Fast cycle required by Kota, and in Triple Elixir, that's going to be easily done. But another sustained push. The second Elixir Golem comes into the fray with this one. The Tornado and Fireball isn't enough to sustain through the battle healer another golem being deployed the cycle comes in so fast it's gonna overwhelm this tower and make sure that he keeps that hp advantage he currently yeah, again, has those, those elixir golem blobs do not mean as much when you're in a situation where your elixir is being replenished at such a high speed another golem throw down the defense is raving he, he's got look you can see him cycling he's cycling uh, fireballs because he knows that he needs to get this to a low amount and try and win in overtime he's got to get another fireball out he's just over he can't out-damage the Earthquake. It comes down to the tiebreaker, and that's Ivan, who's going to take it away, securing himself 5,000 euros and a third-place finish at the Red Bull MEO. Oh, blimey, O'Reilly. Congratulations, Ivan. I particularly want to commend both players' commitments to what are clearly their favourite decks, of course, the Elixir Golem for Ivan and Kota. Bless him. And that expo, I feel like maybe Kota's flying the flag and we're going to see that more often I don't in know. The, 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 you know, while I like Expo, one of the problems with it is that the Earthquake exists uh, and that makes it very difficult. It's a good spell that deals with it nicely. So I, I think I do. Yeah, I know Trid's making little faces at me right now, but I do. I do think Expo is good, but it only into certain matchups and those matchups were not the ones that Ivan were running. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for the grand final of Red Bull MEO Season 2 Clash Royale. Thank you very much, Frankie. We're going to jump into this first game of our final. Both players have guaranteed themselves at least 10,000 euros for getting to this point arc, but the difference maker is going to be that 15,000 euros. And early units have already been traded. And again, the tornado bait from Lecky Lick, Necky Lick, sorry, is going to bring that bandit over to the King Tower and end up getting that activated early. Yeah, and activate the King Tower so early on is going to give Nekalik a, a really serious advantage here uh, with, with so little HP damage dealt to both sides. I think that's going to make a big difference to how this game plays out now. Uh, here comes the Mega Knight for Bale. He's going to be rushing up against that Dark Prince. Gets the slam damage as well. That's lethal. A lot of value going to be got from this Mega Knight. Resources spent across the board to deal with him. It's such an oppressive force running down the board arc. And it's the only thing it's not going to be able to touch is that baby dragon. But here comes the Infernal to support him. And the connection is there for Bale in this first game. A huge blow to that right-hand tower. 
absolutely a really good solid amount of damage early on by Bale and despite that King Tower being activated uh, the, the Mega Knight just showing how dominant a card it is currently right now and very difficult to shut down it didn't seem to slow despite being very much low on health and look at this mini Pekka now and easily distracted though however by the uh, the goblins there yeah they're gonna give him a nice little shank in the torso and here comes the bandit connecting with the Dark Prince gets rid of that shield and will die to the turret it stops the Dark Prince's assault and buys more time for another Mega Knight to get put down. We know how this interaction goes from last time, and it demands a response from Neki Lick. Yeah, look at the difference in Alexa here as well. Bale has got a considerable advantage going with this Mega Knight, and um, I think that uh, Neki Lick might struggle to defend this, and actually Bale can just sit back. He hasn't got to do anything at all, and just gradually building up Elixir now for what is probably going to be a very, very big push now going into double Elixir time. But there comes the ram, it completely jumps over the river and makes a beeline for that turret. Golem committed on the left hand side, so a heavy deck being played by Neki as well as it comes down the left hand side. But that turret's gone down for Bale, so he has the true edge and the ram just won't stop cutting off so much HP from the King Tower. Yeah, at the moment, Bale has got a considerable amount of elixir for this defense, but the lightning goes down, taking down a uh, troop there in the Mega Knight. I don't think he's going to be able to defend this very easily at all. This could be devastating here for Bale if Nikolic can pull this off and a bandit going in, trying to get some desperation damage on that King Tower there as well. He's got a good answer here. As long as he can keep his Princess Tower up or keep the King Tower up from this one, he's going to be able to counter-attack onto Nekali. But that's a very aggressive goal and put on his front door. The Infernal Dragon luckily going to connect, trying to pull him out of range. So a reset will come in and buy even more time for a connection. But they're wailing against this King Tower right now, dropping it way below what was possible. The Ram making a desperation rush, but there's a mini Pekka there to catch. So there's HP. It might come down to a free crown here are because the king towers are looking awfully low yeah bale is struggling to find his momentum now this golem pick card by neki lake is just throwing it all out of uh, proportion here and bale is struggling to be able to find his composure here uh, look at the king tower down both sides below 1000 hp and now the queen tower for uh for neki side seems to be a favorable option as well for bale but there's that golem expected. Mini Peck is going to catch the aggro, draw the ira of the infernal dragon as that golem goes over to the right-hand side and not for the king tower. There's a lot of defensive options here for Bale and a counter-attack could be lethal. This infernal dragon is shredding through the golem. The lightning goes down as well. Only 200 HP, 100 HP. Oh no, Bale one more shot. Oh, oh Nicky Lick. down. He's able to find it at the end. Such a close game to come down. It didn't go to the free crown as we may have predicted Ark because they were able to settle for the second Princess Tower. Neki Lick drawing first blood in our final. Wow, what an explosive start. And I think we can expect uh, some close matches to come from both of these players. I, I didn't expect it to start quite so evenly matched, but uh, it definitely felt like uh, holding back on that Golem card for Nekilink there uh, definitely went in his favor and uh, took Bale by surprise. Game number two on your screens. Let's jump straight into it. And hesitation right now, building up to 10 Elixir before any moves are going to be made. And the leak starts until the bandit has been deployed on the right hand side. There's a miner being used defensively just to catch that bandit. So we know that miner is going to be in Neki's arsenal just when he wants to use it in a more optimal way. Yeah, Neki like not, uh, not hiding back on the defensive side of what we've seen already today. Being a very good strategy. The uh, uh, the, the Lava Hound going down as well. The, the zap to the left hand side there with that uh, Ram Rider going. Getting some good damage and support from the Goblins. Could be a lot of damage going down here on Nekalink's Tower. But a big strong push on the right hand side going in. The Poison as well. So much going on already, Trid. Big commitment on the right-hand side from Nekulik. He was happy to take that damage, but he needs to get something for it on this right-hand side. I don't think the trade has been efficient. Infernal Dragon's going to get a lot of value here. Great catch with the Bandit, but it just doesn't equal out what he lost. That trade heavily in favor of Bale. Yeah, very simple push as well. Ram Rider with Goblin support, and um, it was just uh, an undefended attack, and it, I think that's going to come back, uh, back to be very costly for Nekulik there. Yeah, it would not surprise me, Ark. So, 1 minute 30, there's the Goblin Hut in the middle. So, we're going to have a very stagnated mid-game, hopefully, as they try and get these small advantages before committing with something a little bit beefier, like the Lava Hound. 
but that Ram Raider going to be able to head straight for those tower, towers wherever it wants to. The golems will split and hopefully get rid of that hut in the middle when it crosses the bridge. Yeah, we might see the Ram Rider. Now we are going to see it pop down there and surely the goblins will take down the tower. But the uh, the barbarians will be a very, very strong defense and not going to finalize the damage on that tower just yet. And uh, Mega Knight oh, Mega Knight. is the final card. the last card? He's going to squash the barbarians. <laughs> yeah, going to squash those barbarians and walk forward. This is Bale putting Neki Lick on his last life because that Mega Knight is certainly going to connect. So it has to be the trade-off here. Neki Lick going for the right-hand tower, but there's a good response already set up from Bale. I don't think he's going to get away with this one, Ark. He may have just gifted Bale this game. Yeah, absolutely. The, the elixir was just not in his favor. And uh, now look at this. Uh, a really pretty solid defense here. The miner's getting some continuous chip damage, but only a fireball really here to cycle. Great catch by the barbs. And so, yeah, and so much going on on this right-hand side now yeah so the defense wasn't as strong as it was previously for bale but he does still keep the princess tower alive goblin hunt had to catch that ram rider who's coming in close infernal dragons will be traded there's only 500 hp keeping that right hand tower in the game and bale has done enough to keep it alive the fireball comes in the cycle will not come in fast enough and bale will equalize the series what a great response then from Bale, and uh, we are one apiece now. Um, I'm I'm really keen to see now what the response will be in terms of the cards, the decks that these two players will bring in next, and uh, whether some mind games will start to form uh, in that respect as well. Jumping into game three very quickly. Gonna jump into it now. So Neki looks still on the right hand side, Bale on the blue side, sorry. Not the right hand side. It's up and down in this game arc. It's <laughs> gonna be red for Neki Lick as he deploys that goblin hut as his first card, and there's a musketeer ready to meet them. Yeah, we're not having much in the way of uh, some some bleed at the beginning of these games going straight on in then. Uh, the Musketeer does connect and uh, the log going in as well. As I imagine Bale looking to suck to find uh, something in his hand. Um, Heal Spirit going down as well, looking to get some value, I guess, from this Musketeer who might even connect here. Zap, but one shot nonetheless taken on that tower. There's those Royal Hogs. As soon as I saw that Heal Spirit arc, I was looking forward to this one. The Hogs are going to find that connection only briefly, though. The Fireball was great. It did miss that beefier hog on the left hand side is going to make sure a lot of value can still come from this engagement wow bale then getting a lot of damage despite not having the heal spirit to support these royal hogs uh getting about a thousand hit point of damage on that left hand side tower uh Nekilik, uh definitely wasn't too pleased about that interaction there yeah there's the goblin hut again earthquake coming out so more cards are revealed and there's a great shutdown for that goblin hut as it now pushes that tower even closer to destruction as the log will ride in. There's the Lava Hound, so a similar deck for Neki Lick wants to make it work this time around. But the Royal Hogs on the right-hand side haven't had a response apart from the Flying Machine. They're chomping away at the tower, and they've dealt even more damage on that right-hand side. This is surely going to shift the focus over the Lava Hound finally into the territory of Bale, and it's a bit of a push building up for Neki. Oh, but look at this kite there from the Ice Golem taking those Barbarians for a walk then. But nevertheless, the Lava Hound has locked on, um, and that could be devastating for this tower here. But look at this. So Bale in such a great position now with so much damage on both the left and the right hand side towers and another kite then again on those barbarians. This is surely looking very good for Bale right now. Splitting aggro, splitting piggies. Their health keeps deteriorating. The only thing that will shut this down is if someone decides to hit up that left tower. The mini pecker, one shot should do it and ha -cha! takes out that right tower. But the Bell Hound gonna go on the left hand side now with the ice golem just about to encroach as well. Earthquake splitting the difference. No one has shut down this pecker on the right hand side. He's, going for it. He's gonna deal so much damage, but he wasn't enough to shut down the free crown. It is looking disastrous for Neki to come back into this one. The Lava Hound is connected, but nothing else will. There's a bombardment in front. The reinforcements are coming in, and the Royal Hogs are making a beeline for the tower. But they've been caught up by the Goblin Hunt. The Earthquake will continue to erode, and the Baby Dragon will catch up the remnants. It's going to surely only be a matter of time now. Bale has played this one to perfection. The King Tower below 600 HP. The Queen Tower below 500 HP. And now the pressure is really on. Neki Link still surviving on and holding on 
on with everything he's got. But now the Royal Hawk's going in. It's got to all be over here. Surely in this final push, the Hill Spirit, the Zap. It's the Mini Pekka with the hit. And there we have it. Bale will take it two games now to one. Everything on the left-hand side drawing his attention. He couldn't stop that one chop from the Mini Pekka. So it will mean that we go with a 2-1 scoreline. Let's jump into game number four as fast as we can and keep the action coming. Nekilik still on the red side of the map for Bales Blue. I mean, it was Nekilik at the beginning, which looked very comfortable. But now, look, we're seeing Bale here getting to the swing of things and finding some confidence. And uh, straight off the bat, going to get two, almost three hits then out of that Hog Rider. So we could be seeing a Hog Cycle deck. Oh, no, Giant Skeleton coming in as well. Yeah, Giant Skeleton's going to make an appearance, draw the aggro of the Dark Brink and stop him from getting any kind of connection. The Musketeer's there to back him up as he heads over to that bridge. The Skeleton Giant going to struggle to get much value, maybe able to make sure the Musketeer falls down. But the Sparky deck coming out again. We saw this get shut down earlier by the likes of an Electro Dragon comp, um, but it's not going to be the case here i don't think earthquakes going to slow it down and do a little bit of damage but there's nothing substantial to take that beefy sparky shot as it comes in the goblin giant is going to slap down this turret yeah goblin giant is the first thing we've seen today and i wonder how um bale is going to respond with an electro dragon uh, electro wizard sorry on that sparky a uh, good counter card there but look at this mini pecker getting some great shots then on bale's tower taking it down to 1000 hp and uh, that was a, a, a great push from Nekilik there. Bale forced to show all of his hands right now. So they know he's got the E Wizards and that's something that Neki can play around because it is his only effective shutdown to this Sparky that exists in his deck. And never hog then as well. The cycle continues for Bale and shot down by a fireball and the Dark Prince to finish it off. That hog didn't get a single hit. And now Bale on the defense with the mini pecker, the swipe one, the swipe two, and the third swipe. But uh, yeah, for me, uh, pretty solid defense there from Neki Link. Yeah, it's sitting on a lot of looks right now. Sparky on the left-hand side. So the e Wiz will come out at some point, but wants to send some resources on the right to capitalize on the Elixir advantage he has. Only a small amount of chip damage. The Musky drawn over to the right, but the Firecracker should have some safety with this one as he creates some space between himself and the Goblin and Giant. He's going to trot along to the site. Sparky still doesn't have that answer. The Skeleton Giant has to tank the HP, but it's two units that can shred through him. The Mini Pecker and the Sparky. There's going to be a connection on the left-hand side because there's nothing to block it. And one shot gets through before he's broken down. 573 HP on the right-hand side. This is still winnable as the Hog Rider goes in. The Earthquake's there as well. Gets one connection, shreds through it, and the tower may not go down here. 126 remaining, but the Firecracker gets that shot in from afar to take it out. My goodness me, what an amazing display that the Earthquake spell just slowing down the Sparky's effectiveness. The tower goes down, and now the defense is going to be on point here. If uh, Bayonet is going to be able to survive it, 10 seconds left. The Sparky in the right hand side, surely it gets shut down, Fred. Yeah, and there's going to be the connection. It's unavailable. Neki Lick unable to find it right now. So the match is going over. Bell won. Oh my goodness. Bale is going to walk away with the victory in this matchup, and he is your Red Bull MEO champion. He is indeed. Congratulations to Bale doing his home country of Spain and his local Clash Royale community proud. He's also taken a whopping 25,000 euros in prize money. Nekilik taking second and 10,000 euros. What a way to end though. It was so impressive to see you. Bale really growing confident and confidence and it seemed like he kind of fixed those mistakes as well up. Yeah, it was great to see uh, the display of going from being actually down in that first game and just getting confidence as he went. It's a very difficult thing when you're under that pressure to kind of come back after a first loss and, and kind of brush it off. But Bale did that so successfully well and just we just could continue to see him grow throughout this competition and uh, what a uh, finale there to display. And it was a shame in a way for Nekilik because throughout the tournament so far, we've seen him be very patient around his elixir management, very calculated, very careful on the defense. And yet it seemed like maybe he got baited into copying his opponent, just trying to send through attacks, trying to win the matches much earlier than we've seen so far, Trid. Do you think that was the reason why he's only walking away with second today? Yeah, I just don't think he was able to 
keep up with Bale. I think he overcommitted on a lot of these pushes, put too much stock into his own deck, and thought that he could persevere throughout the defense that Bale was putting out. Well, Bale was able to get in these jabs and defend effectively where Neki just couldn't. And that's one of the reasons why Bale is walking away as our champion. Well, I want to check in one last time with our super analyst, Woody, because I have a feeling he's going to break it down just as it happened for us. Once more with feeling, Frankie. Neki Lick came stomping back in action with a rare Golem beatdown deck up against Mega Knight Ram Rider from Bale. It was an early lead for Bale, who pulverized the first tower and made a snap decision to push the king. This set up a tricky round of play in alternating lanes where knowing when to take damage was just as important as knowing where to dish it back. Staring death in the face, Neki scored a lightning fast finish moments before his own impending end. Game two was an open and shut case for Bale, whose rapid fire attacks rendered a solemn verdict for Neki Lick. Floating aloof past over 2,000 damage he allowed on his own tower, Neki Lick must have thought his enormous push in the first minute would vindicate him. This would not pass for Bale, whose Inferno Dragon defense was so efficient that he soon threatened Regicide for a distraught Neki. Although the scales tipped back toward Neki, his early fault would prove fatal against him as time ran out. An explosive Game 3 followed suit with just as much carnage as the last two. A missed fireball from Neki Lick gave Bale the early lead with a Royal Hogs Cycle deck. Add to this a mini peck, a rampage, which was completely ignored on his king, and Neki's lava miner just couldn't keep up. Avoiding mistakes is far more crucial than making clutch plays, a fact discerning viewers won't soon forget. The stage thus set, our players returned for the final act. Neki Lick surged ahead with a Goblin Giant Sparky deck, whose mini P.E.K.K.A. stole the show with a breakout performance. But the very next scene saw Bali's Electro Wizard equalize the tower damage with no response from Neki. With the whole script thrown out, Neki dropped a Sparky in the opposite lane for a push that was countered by Bale for a positive four elixir trade. His final hog thus acquired, Bale read his last lines and gave a bow before his standing ovation. Thanks very much for tuning in. My name's Woody, and this was my final transmission. Time now to beam you back to Frankie. Thank you so much, Woody, and thank you for your expert analysis all throughout this episode. Now, our grand champion is, of course, Bale from Spain, and we had to get some words from our winner. So here's Freya talking to Bale. It's my absolute pleasure to be joined by Bale Champions here at Red Bull MEO World Finals. Thank you so much for joining me and massive congratulations on your win once again. I want to know what is going through your head right now knowing that you are the champion here. ¿Qué, qué, te, está, qué te está pasando en tu cabeza ahora que sabes que eres el campeón de Red Bull? ¿Qué piensas de eso? La verdad que es algo bastante impresionante, pero no sé, cuando lo jugaba no, no pensaba en ni en llegar a ser campeón de Red Bull, ni, ni cuando estaba en la final. Yo simplemente jugaba porque me divierte jugar, porque me gusta el juego y quería hacerlo lo mejor posible. Y finalmente gané. Así que contento. All right. Uh, so, initially, I wasn't... Now it's a bit surreal for me that uh, I, I won. But at the time when I was playing, uh, I wasn't thinking about the final. I wasn't thinking about winning. I was just thinking about playing the games because I like the game. I like to play and I always play. But now I'm super happy because at the end I managed to win. I love to hear that. So as a player with so much experience playing at high level tournaments, do you think that experience helped you coming into this competition? Eh, ¿Piensas que por qué tienes mucha experiencia jugar torneo muy grande contra otros pros y otra gente muy, muy buena? ¿Te ayudó con la experiencia en ese torneo? No, sí, sin duda, o sea, me, eh, tanto jugar en OCL, en presenciales, contra, contra gente súper buena, en competitivo y demás, y, y tener que emparejarme contra ellos ayuda mucho, sobre todo para mejorar como, como jugador y, y, no, y, ta, y también en el, en el tema nervios y saber cómo afrontar y estar calmado en las situaciones difíciles y, so, y sobrellevarlas bien. Uh, yeah, for sure. Like playing in the OCL as well as in LAN tournaments and, you know, against top players in uh, various leagues has helped me a ton. And uh, the main thing that has helped me as well is uh, that uh, at the start when I used to play against uh, these sort of players, maybe I was a bit more nervous and, you know, 
buckle under the pressure, but now I'm uh, really chill about it. And uh, the, this is the main thing that experience has helped. Well, that's so fantastic to hear. Now, the all important question, how are you going to be celebrating this one once we're out of lockdown? Bueno, uh, la pregunta final es, ¿cómo te va a celebrar esta victoria después de la cuarentena? Pues eh, la verdad que a ver cuándo salimos de la cuarentena, pero eh, supongo que una quedada con mis amigos en algún sitio guay y que, que estemos todos ahí, la, la gente importante y tal, y pasar un buen rato. Well, first of all, we need to figure out when we actually get out of this lockdown, but... Uh... He said, uh, he said, obviously, like, once we actually get out, you know, like, go out with my friends, uh, uh, meet up all together in a nice place and just have some fun. Oh, fantastic. Well, congratulations once again on that incredible win. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. Thank you so much, Freya, and congratulations again to Bayer. But let's take one final look at the bracket just to find out how exactly our Spaniard took the Clash Royale crown at Red Bull MEO Season 2. So you can see we had 32 players in our international finals. We brought them down to the top 16 and then we had our playoffs. And there were some, some, some impressive, I suppose, debuts you could call them, Trid, because we didn't necessarily know some of these players before. Anyone who you think has a bright future? Um, I wasn't personally too familiar with Kota Watanabe, but he definitely appeared on my radar over the course of the tournament. So it's something I'll keep an eye out for in future, I feel. What about you, Excalibur? Uh, yeah, I think um, Neki, uh, Neki Lick, the guy who came second, I think he uh, he's, he's sort of impressed me, even though getting the second position, he's like a runner-up, but I, I still think he was a very impressive player. I uh, hope to see more from him in the future. And our third place, I was about to call him contestant, but we say player in esports. I need to remind myself that from time to time. Ivan, Ark, do you think that on a different day, this could have been his tournament? Oh yeah, very much so. I mean, uh, definitely displaying uh, some clear signs of, of being a very talented player. And uh, I think that uh, it might, may have come down to nerves or just not having the right cards on the day. And there's so many things that can come in uh, to factor against uh, or for a player doing well or not. And uh, I think Ivan, for me, can absolutely kind of leave today uh, with his head held high nonetheless. In fact, all our players can. So, I mean, never a wiser word has been spoken, to be perfectly honest, Ark. And thank you so much to you, to Scoundrel and to Trid for being on the casting desk, for putting up with me. Thank you to Woody and Freya for being fantastic contributors, to our players for taking part and to everyone who made this tournament happen. That's all from us for now, but we look forward to seeing you in season three. I've been Frankie Ward. Good night.